Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before our meeting begins, we will have an invocation offered by Commissioner Brady, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Almighty God, we are gathered here today to serve you. Give us knowledge and strength to do your will with a proper balance of eternal values and our present needs. May we accept our responsibilities and act with courage, considering the feelings of other people. Grant us a sense of justice and stewardship, both now and forever. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you call the roll, please? Mr. Waddington? Here. Ms. Lloyd? Here. Mr. Lockhart? Here. Mr. Murray? Here. Mr. Poole? Here. Ms. Twine? Here. Mr. Brady? Here. Commissioners, you have before you the minutes of our meeting of January 23, 2017. What is your pleasure? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waddington. I move that we accept the minutes of the January 23rd meeting and dispense with the formal reading. Second. It's been a motion and second discussion. Without objection, the motion will be approved. And hearing no objection, the motion is approved. We had a last-minute uh, cancellation in the presentation. The first one there from Harbor Creek Designs uh, will be postponed, hopefully, until next meeting, um, and we'll be able to hear from uh, from those folks then. And without further ado, we have the Sandusky Tree Commission here, represented by uh, Brianne Holman, and uh, we are and several others with you. If you'd introduce your uh, other commission members, I'd appreciate that. And thank you all for being here. Jim Arthur. Cynthia Ball. Thank you all for being here. Well, I want to say thank you for uh, allowing us to come. We, we want to always try to do this at least once a year. Um, most of you guys all know me. Um, I normally talk a lot. I'm not feeling very well, so lucky you guys. It should be <laughs> so, um, Again, I'm just going to start with a few years ago we did a tree inventory. Um, it allowed us to record exactly what was going on um, within the boulevard trees and just give a little bit of an assessment of exactly what type of value those trees really served for the city. So in that assessment, we found out that we had about a $9 million asset that pretty much ran along most of our, most of our uh, streets. That doesn't even include what's at some of the other public areas, like the parks and other uh, public facilities. Overall, our canopy is actually in very good condition, despite the fact that there are lots of um, uh, trees that are, are a little bit in poor condition. They just kind of stick out like sore thumbs, I think, more than, than others. Few things are we have a very, very mature tree stock. Basically, most of the trees that are here in the city are very old. That adds to a lot of character, but can also add to a lot of maintenance issues. And uh, with those maintenance is issues, we've had uh, lots of issues with conflicting wires, sidewalk heaving, and different things like that. That has really kind of stepped up the conversation on what, what really needs to be done. So, um, if, if people have been following the trees as much as the, the Tree Commission does, um, there was a few years where obviously budgets were what they were, and so there wasn't as much maintenance that was going on. Um, you can kind of see this from 2012 on, um, you know, tree removal, <coughs> tree trimming, um, and then planting. You know, we're a little bit on the lower end. Now since the Issue 8 funding and some of the other funding that we've had and a few grants, the city has really, really stepped that up lately. Now there's a lot of people who still are complaining, maybe they still see a lot of uh, standing trees or conflicting trees and things like that, but you know, it, what this graph really shows, or what this table really shows, is the fact that the city is really stepping it up, um, way more than they have in the past. And so um, it, it's definitely something that makes us happy, but it's definitely something that, you know, we're not where we want to be yet, and uh, I'm sure lots of people have seen that. Just to kind of look at last year's uh, spending, there was over $105,000 that was spent um, on tree care in the city. That's actually about $25,000 more than the previous year. Most of that money went to tree removals and trimming. Um, the rest of that money went to plantings and um, you see there's a really large emergency. Uh, those are basically any time that there's a storm and there's a big active cleanup, you know, whether trees are falling or whether there's branches that, that, that fall. 
Most of that money, again, came from Issue 8. Stormwater funds pretty much provided a lot of the tree planting money. And then the Great Lakes Initiative grant also provided some tree planting money as well. Um, another uh, thing that, that's really uh, new for the, for the Tree Commission and also for um, the Services Center is that <coughs> GIS is now starting to be used a little bit. This was kind of that whole idea that we did this inventory, we wanted to record where every tree was, what current condition it was in, so that now as management starts to take place in the city, we can now start recording that as well on a spatial format and be able to show people and then better be able to communicate amongst departments. Um, this uh, GIS platform right now is actually being used to help coordinate the sidewalk uh, tree removals and then the regular maintenance uh, tree removals and trimming as well too. So basically this data set's is just going to keep getting better for the city. Some highlights that uh, I'd like to share from last year's uh, work both with the city and with the tree commission. Um, we really did spend a, a, a decent amount of effort on education and outreach. We decided to hold two events, a Go Green event and then a Fall into the Greenhouse event, so basically spring and fall. Those were times that we could talk to the community about what was going on in the city with the trees, give them a little bit more tips on how to take care of their own trees. You know, at the Tree Commission, we think a lot about, you know, what are the trees within those boulevards and the, and the park space that we really need to, to manage from um, the municipal city end of it, but we also have lots of other trees on private property. So a lot of the work is also educating others on how best to take care of their trees so that there's um, no major issues. Another uh, uh, bonus thing that happened last year is the city received a, a growth award, and um, each year you receive a, a city, or excuse me, a Tree City USA award if you maintain a certain level of uh, tree care, have a tree commission, things like that. Growth awards are when um, you're recognized for actually increasing your effort. So in the past year, with the amount of additional money being spent for tree maintenance and tree planting, as well as some additional education. Um, we were able to get a growth award. So, um, Again, I mentioned before, grant funds are being used to help to plant some trees. Last year, 61 trees were planted. Um, it was a little bit over, I believe, $12,000 um, through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. These trees are being planted in target areas of parks. And if you guys had been down to the Paper District Marina, um, that was a pretty obvious planting that got done last year. So you can see those trees there. Another notable event from 2016 is the June microburst storm. Um, this was the storm that caused a lot of damage. This, that $29,000 of emergency funds that was used last year, four trees, 23,000 of it was one storm event. And again, this is just one of those things that just kind of shows you when you have um, an older tree stock, you know, again, I said more than 50% of the trees are mature, which means they're very large trees in the city. Combined with a storm event like these straight-lined winds, um, the National Weather Service uh, stated that the winds were anywhere from uh, 70 to 80 miles an hour for about five minutes, um, maxing out at about 90 miles an hour. And you can kind of see a little bit here the green dots that are there. What was unique about this, and I'm sorry, I'm from the Soil and Water Conservation District, so everything in my world goes back to soils. Um, one of the interesting things here is that if you look at this very bottom map of the city of Sandusky, right in the heart of the city is a pretty unique soil that has a very shallow bed bedrock. So when you get a very large tree on top of a very shallow soil to, um, to bedrock, you don't have very much depth for that tree to root. It's not that trees really root very, very deep, but when you combine that with a road and a sidewalk and homes, the tree doesn't really have a lot of space um, to really anchor it itself in. If you don't maintain the canopy of that tree by proper trimming, you know, thinning out of that canopy, you basically have a giant sail for winds to grab it and then less roots. So it's just one of those things to keep in mind. It's not to say we don't plant any trees in this area, but we do have to be careful as these trees start to age. And if we haven't been doing a lot of uh, trimming maintenance, you know, you, you're going to run um, having a much higher damage uh, cost and cleanups when we have a unique weather event like what we had. From the tree inventory, we actually did a, a, a USDA has a storm uh, risk tree analysis. Essentially, that is based off of the age of the tree. Again, we have a very, very um, old tree stock in the city, so we have from that list, we had about uh, 1,500 trees that fit within a storm risk category. <coughs> 
Recommendations, you know, we sit and we talk a lot about, um, you know, where we currently are, where we want to be um, as far as the uh, tree commission meetings. And so we just wanted to pass along some recommendations um, uh, to not only, you know, this, these are things that we've talked with Brad about, but it's just also things um, for the commission itself to be aware of. Working towards this zone maintenance, we are playing catch up still with our trees. And so, you know, this, the city has really given a lot of support to allow some of that catch up to happen. We're not caught up yet. So um, please continue that, that support to, have, to allow um, increased trimming to take place. And eventually we'd like to move to a zone trimming, a lot like the zones of the leaf cleanup you know, um, we just think it would be much more structured. And it's something that was done several years ago, but, but was abandoned due to financial reasons. Um, we also need to increase the planting to removal ratio. For about uh, five or six years before now, we're starting to plant a little bit more. We were taking down between two and three and a half trees for every tree we planted. So, you know, we're trying to reverse that trend, and I think uh, we're, we're already kind of on the way of doing so. But we have actually lost a lot of our tree canopy, both with the storms and then just with our own um, increased removal. Um, there was an urban forest management plan. It's, uh, it's uh, rather on the old side. Obviously, knowing where you are and where you want to be and helping to set some of those objectives, I think, create good transparency amongst departments and amongst the community. And then um, some of our codes haven't been reviewed in a while, and so that was just another thing that we thought it was time to review some codes, maybe um, change a few things that, that maybe allow it so that not only this, the city uh, can manage the trees, but maybe there's some, some opportunities where the citizens can kind of engage in some of this management as well. So if anyone wants to sit and talk to us, share us ideas, um, our meetings are always the last Tuesday of the month, 4 o'clock at the Greenhouse. And I just want to have everyone mark their cal calendars. Um, we will be celebrating Arbor Day, January 29th. <laughs> that don't fill up. April 29th in the greenhouse from 10 to 1 o'clock. So. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Holman. Commissioners, questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lockhart. Um, I serve on the Tree Commission with Ms. Holman and the other people that are here. Happy to see them here in attendance. Um, Looking at what we've been doing in the Tree Commission, we have realized that a lot of people have may have made complaints or just in general concern about their tree. And so in talking to Bree and some of the other members of the Tree Commission, I think that now might be the time going into 2018 so that we make a strategic plan to have a best recommendation to the city as to how we should take care of the trees. And in that, utilize the GIS to let everyone know where we are, with the trees, which trees are being trimmed, what's going on in their neighborhood uh, going forward. So I guess maybe that's a motion. I don't know. Uh, Should I put it that way? I'm not sure what the motion would be, uh, Commissioner. Uh, to allow the Tree Commission to form a strategic plan to make a recommendation to the city uh, as to how that plan should be carried out. Uh, Trimming and zone and processing. Yeah. I think we could just do that. I, I, I would. It sounds like what you're. Look, that's the second you can talk about. Um, there. So okay. What you to do. That's fine. There's a motion to second. Uh, Ms. Holman, it sounds like that's where you're headed uh, in, in all events, was just to make a series of recommendations Correct. for the commission. And um, I don't know if you would like us to support that by way of a motion or whether um, that's something the commission wants to do. So I guess I'll throw it out there. Commissioners, other questions or comments on, on the motion? Can we include talking about whatever she asked and the questions for the motion? Or do we have to sure. dispense with the motion before I can ask a question about the presentation? <laughs> uh, oh, I see. <laughs> Anything further on the motion? Uh, okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion cast. So with that, that's your formal support then, so. Okay. There's both. No, I got a question. <laughs> Would you go back to, uh, and it, it, it all ties together. Um, storm risk, the 1,500 trees in the storm risk, it said 90% good canopy under it. Oh, first of all, how much risk, what, ri what are we risking? How much risk? So and what, what, a, the what a storm risk tree essentially means is that it, that, that USDA uh, calculation is based off of any given storm, you're going to have like winds, right? And so it's based off of what is your risk of damage to those trees you know, of coming down, you know, so it doesn't really, it doesn't assess what that damage amount might be, like if it falls on a house or a car or something like that. No, 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 likely to fall down. Okay. We have 1,500 trees that are likely to fall down in what kind of winds? 
Does we it, have, is that what it's telling you? We have 1,500 trees that in any high wind events could probably experience significant damage. Okay. That's what the assessment's based on. And, and a lot of that, again, when you have a large tree, you have a large canopy. If you have a large canopy, it starts to act like a big sail. And so it's just one of those things. Not to say, oh, cut down on all 1,500 trees, but it just it's helping you to assess where risks may lie in terms of, of your management. Okay. Do we have you, or if you have not done so with what we've just asked you to do, would you consider <coughs> identifying those trees of that 1,500 and you can put an assessment of how likely you think they are to fall in what, what amount of wind so that we can get them cut down? We have spent an insignificant amount of money on tree trimming. When I look at 6,000 trees at the rate we're going of 80 to 100 a year, they do keep growing. We will never catch up, if we, and we should if we've got trees that are likely to fall, because we know it. We need to get, taken, get those taken care of before they cause damage, whatever it may be. Right. Well, and I, and I think some of that has, uh, with the sidewalk program right now, um, there's been good coordination that's been going on with going out and looking at some of the trees that were kind of like, should you take them down? They look healthy. And some of them actually were in a, just they're just a big tree. And so when we looked at it, we thought, you know, this is the time to take them down. They're just a big tree and they pose that risk, that storm damage risk. So some of those conversations are starting to happen. I think if we start really thinking about a, an actual plan of the whole city, that's when those kinds of questions can be teased out a little bit. But it's, what I will say, I'm sorry, I'll just caution it's hard you. to identify exactly when a tree is going to fall with okay. winds. So. I, I, yeah, I heard you to say that those are at risk but not likely to fall down. Correct. And then we don't necessarily need to take them all down. Some of them just need to be trimmed. Correct. Okay. Right. Exactly. I just want you to identify them and the ones you're coordinating and all that that have come down from the sidewalk program, check them off the list. The idea is at the end of the day we know where we stand. And people at home have some general idea that, that they it looks like we're looking out for their best interest and not leaving trees up. Uh, un, un, and I think that's what's exciting about this new GIS uh, coordination that's going on, is that we're finally going to be able to have hard numbers. We're going to be able to show where things are happening. So. Ms. Holman or, or Mr. Link, uh, either one of you or other members of the Tree Commission might be able to answer this, but at, we're, we are catching up. We're making progress dealing with the dead and dying trees, and we've stepped up planting efforts. If we continue at this rate, when would you say, does anybody have a gut feel for when we'd be caught up? Is it, is it five years? Is it ten years? I mean, this, this is, an urban forest is a great value. It takes a long time to create, but I'm just wondering when you're, what your sense is in terms of when we'd be caught up. I'm a numbers person, and that's tough without actually sitting down with the numbers. Um, you, you know, I, I, don't, I remember you, a few years ago, we did estimate exactly how much it would be to, to completely catch up, and something in my mind thinks it was like a $2 million price tag. So, I mean, we're not that, we're not to that spot. So it's gonna take us several years of, you know, spending at least eighty to $100,000 a year before we get back up to that. Thank you. But I, but I don't recall if $2 million was exactly what it was or not. So. Right. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I didn't okay. think to ask the question. <laughs> I just don't I, want to be inaccurate. But if you want to follow up with an email or something, I, I'd certainly appreciate that. Mr. Link, you look like you had something to add. Yes, to you, uh, Commission President. So if you had to put a number, same with Bree, it would be hard to say, does it take 10 years, does it take 20 years? But at 80 to 100 trees, and that's through a contract only. That's only what we're doing through outside services. That's not... Also, what we're trying to ramp up in-house, and as we add people to the forestry division over the next couple of years, whether they're full-time or seasonal or, or however it goes about, our number in-house will also increase. The number of trimmings has already increased. In 16, it's, it's increased. I think it's almost doubled, and I think in 17, you're going to see that number double again. So as we continue to trim these trees of the 1,500, if 1,500 is the number, and we did 100, you know, 15 years, so I think okay. that we're on the right track. Okay, thank you. And then one other question I had, Ms. Holman, and that is, uh, you mentioned uh, updating the codes that pertain to our urban forest. Is that something the Tree Commission is undertaking, or is that something you're asking the Law Department or Mr. Link? I just wasn't sure where that fell. In the past, we've been working with the Law Department. Okay. But... So you're taking the leading oar on that one? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you.
So, Lock, Mr. Locker. Just, just to say, Mr. Chairman, kind of the answer to your question as to how long it will take, that's the purpose of creating this plan so we can see where we have been, where we're going, and where we will be. So this is more of a, an outlay of where everyone can see where we are so it satisfies everyone. Mr. Paul. Mr. Chairman, just a comment. Um, the amount of money, I think 100 trees a year, uh, most of us will be dead and we'll never catch up because trees keep growing. Speak for yourself. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't think doubling the, amount, the budget that we're spending on taking down trees and, and trying to catch up would be too much. It's an insignificant amount of money when you consider uh, it was $105,000 for the entire city, of which 25000 of it was an emergency. 29000 was an emergency. We are not spending anywhere near enough money on something that's extremely important. So as we move to the budget <coughs> move forward, I'd like to see much more money spent on this. Further Mr. questions Chairman? or comments? Ms. Lloyd. Um, I couldn't agree with Commissioner Poole more. And Ms. Holman, thank you so much for being here. And the Tree Commission also. Um, I feel like in talking to you guys when I see you around town, um, there's a real passion with this commission. And um, I think it's important for our residents to understand the process that we're going through and that you are moving in a positive direction and we are gaining ground. Just be patient and it'll take time. But um, thank you so much and fully support you guys. Right. Thank you very much for the work that you do and for being here and for shepherding this great asset that we have in the city. Okay, Ms. Heinrich Alexander is here with us, and you uh, asked for an opportunity to address the commission, and this would be a delightful time to do that. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm, we are here to thank you for um, the, doc, the support of the Dr. Martin Luther King three-day weekend. Uh, in 2007 of February, the city of Sandusky bestowed upon me a key to the city. This was an investment. So this 10 years later, I received some of the interest that came from this investment that you gave me 10 years ago. But I want to say to Mr. Dave Bodicheng, I just have to say, if every commissioner um, from the city managers, the secretary to the police department work as hard as Mr. Waterton, I think the city of Sandusky is in good hand. Okay? <laughs> but I'm going to let uh, Brenda Jones, we both... You know, we, we, we all we try, but we can't keep <laughs> Brenda Jones, we are kind of outlaws together. We kind of put this program together along with the hard-working city commissioner, Mr. Dave Waterton. So I'm going to let her give you an outline. I just want to thank you. And I'm hoping that this will not be the first time that we can reach across the table and feed off of each other. So she's going to give you the outline and what happened. And I'm looking forward to I'm available to work with the city. I'm retired. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the entire city of Sandusky, but especially to the city commission, the Sandusky Police Department, um, our city manager. The weekend was wonderful. It started out on Friday, um, went Friday, Saturday, and we ended Saturday evening. Everything went off without a hitch. We had a tremendous motorcade. I can't say enough about the wonderful, she, she, Dave's always been my buddy, but the Sandusky Police Department, because for every inch that we were there, the police was there. Um, I'm just happy that nothing happened that day because they were out in full force and they gave us the support. We will begin planning again um, for the uh, 2018. Save the date cards will be going out. We will be working with um, the city manager, the planners, second, historic Second Baptist Church. We want to keep them on the radar. Um, it is great, uh, his, has historical significance for this city, and we would like to keep it on the radar and keep it highlighted and to make it a great historical site for the city of Sandusky. Um, again, I want to thank you. 
we're ready to start another project with the Sandusky commissioners, with the city. Um, we've talked about some things at the stadium, and my mind has been spinning ever since that day. So, again, I just want to thank you all for what's been going on and to forming this partnership that we have with the city. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do and for your leadership in, in uh, celebrating that Mr. Chairman, great occasion, Mr. Waddington. I believe uh, Commissioner Brady and I will have a few comments. Out of this, Ida, if you can stand up here. We met at Ebenezer Church last week, and you know my mind's always rolling 100 miles an hour. So we decided we're going to hold this four times a year, every three months, a diversity community roundtable. Commissioner Brady and I are going to host the first one, and that's going to be Saturday, April 8th, here in the city commission chambers from 10 to noon. And we're going to contact local elected officials, clergy, safety forces, Snusky City Schools, Snusky Catholic Schools, any residents that want to sit in on diversity discussions. Uh, the topics will be relationships, drug issues, domestic violence, interaction. And what come out of this, and Dick brought this up at when we sat and had the pumpkin pie and coffee at the Ebenezer Church, we just can't be separate 364 uh, days a year and just meet for Martin Luther King Day. We met at the church. That was fun. We had a blast. We, we went and attended at Sandusky High, the Martin Luther King program. But this is a way we can work together as a community and offset future problems between us through diversity, communication, and building relationships of trust. And I think, you know, we're building, physically we're changing Sandusky, so let's do it as residents also. Let's all become cohesive and work as one group for the common good of Sandusky. 2018 is Mr. Murray campaign night. I'm going to let Mr. Brady take over now because we love you, Ida, and we had a blast there. Thank you. I love you, Mr. Too. Chairman. Brady. I, I can tell you that if you continue to serve us lunch like you have the last few times we've been together, you'll have trouble shaking us. But, but, but I, I think Mr. Waddington uh, speaks very clearly on the issue. It, it, it kind of came to us somewhat simultaneously sitting in the pew of Second Baptist Church that morning, that uh, what a wonderful day that was, and what a shame it is that we do that once a year. Right. We need to do it more than once a year, so that when we do have an issue, and believe me, somewhere out there in the future, there looms an issue that it's not going to be pleasant, that we know each other's names, we know each other's faces, we know where each other live, and we have phone numbers, and perhaps that kind of relationship can derail or neutralize an otherwise very uh, very volatile situation. So I'm, I'm counting on, uh, I think you can count on Mr. Waddington and I to uh, put together something where we meet on a more regular basis. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start the ball rolling from here. We're looking forward to working with you, Thanks all for of your, you. Thanks for your help. Not just the two. Right. I, let's count seven commissioners. And I would like to say this, when we have something, I want to see the people that we put the vote on present. I will, I will be counting. There's some I did see and some I didn't, but I will be looking for it because it's important when you go to the poll. Not, not ask us to take you to the poll when you don't support us after you get past the poll. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Andrew. And thank you, Commissioners Waddington and Brady, for uh, putting that together and your leadership in that regard. All right. Next we have... Audience participation on any of the agenda items. Anyone wish to wishing to comment on any of our agenda items tonight, please come to the microphone. Give us your name and address and share with us your thoughts or questions. My name is Trudy Thompson. My address is 105 Westwater Street, Unit 3B. Um, the reason I'm here is we've been boating in Sandusky for over 20 years, and then we decided to purchase a condo at the Hubbard Building. Um, when we first purchased that, uh, the one thing we didn't have was de designated parking. Uh, we were told that um, plans were in the, in the make to uh, make the parking lot behind the Sandusky Theater a parking garage. As we know, the parking lot has been redone with fewer spaces. It is not a parking garage. Um, then we heard that there was plans to take parking away from Jackson Street Pier. Um, we became very concerned. As residents, there's only certain places that we can park. Uh, as we get older, it's going to be more of an issue. 
Uh, right now, we can park on West Water Street, Shoreline Drive, the uh, parking lot behind the theater, and Jackson Street Pier. Um, depending on what's going on downtown, there's times that Jackson Street Pier is the only place that we can park. Um, we don't have any issue with any of the activities that go on downtown. I think it's great for the city, great for the businesses. But as a resident, we are concerned about the parking. And I have been to a lot of the, uh, any of the um, parking commissions that you've had. I've gone to those and talked about resident parking. So um, we also have a condo at the Chesapeake Lofts that we rent. So there is parking there for those people, but if you live downtown, parking is going to be a major issue the more people come downtown. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, this portion of the meeting is for uh, folks to address the commission regarding any of our standard agenda items as opposed to an open forum, at which we have at the end. Uh, you haven't been here very often, ma'am, so I just thought I'd just let you proceed oh, anyway. Sorry. Not a problem. Uh, but is there anyone else wishing to uh, address the commission on any of our regular agenda items? If not, then we have a public hearing on the 2017-2018 Community Development Block Grant Funding Program. And Ms. Blanca is here to walk us through that. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. President, members of commission. This will be the first of two public hearings concerning the city's 2017 Community Development Block Grant Program year. A consolidated plan advisory committee meeting was also held on February 3rd. As an entitlement city, Sandusky directly receives an allocation of funds from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to carry out selected activities within the community. These eligible activities include, but are not limited to, acquisition, rehabilitation, demolition, code enforcement, economic development activities, public facility projects, infrastructure improvements, and planning activities. Under this grant, there are certain requirements which cannot be exceeded. In general, these include a maximum of 20% of the allocation to be expended at administration and planning expenses, and a maximum of 15% of the allocation to be expended on public services during the program year. 70% of the funds must benefit low to moderate income persons or households. All of the funds must meet one of three national objectives. These include low to moderate income benefit, elimination of slum and blight, and community urgent need. Sandusky anticipates an allocation of approximately $650,000 of new funds, plus some additional carryover funds. The following activities were budgeted in the 2016 program year, which is currently underway. Program administration, $122,000. Fair housing, $9,000. Streets and sidewalks, $237,000. Parks and ADA improvements, $150,000. Clearance and demolition, 85,000. Healthy lifestyles program, 10,000. The code enforcement, 170,000. The help against homelessness program, 40,000. Citizen circle program, 15,000. The economic development revolving loan fund, 55,000. And housing rehabilitation for 40,000. Subrecipient funding applications became available on February 3rd and are due to the Community Development Department no later than 12 p.m. on March 3rd. A draft of the plan will be available on March 10th, after which there will be a 30-day comment period. The draft plan will be available for review at City Hall as well as the Sandusky Library. There will be a, a second Consolidated Plan Advisory Committee meeting on March 24th. On April 10th, there will be a second public hearing held at 5 p.m. during the commission meeting. Public input on community needs relating to CDBG funding can be submitted by written correspondence to the Community Development Department located at 222 Meg Street, emailed to me at ablanca at ci.sandusky.oh.us or by phone at 419-627-5847. Um, additionally, I will be passing around a sign-in sheet for the public hearing tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Blanca. Commissioners, any questions or comments on this very important program? We are very lucky to be an entitlement city and to have these funds available for us as we have for 
lot of years now. I don't I don't know how far back that extends, but a uh, long time. Um, this is a public hearing, and uh, if anyone present wishes to speak on the issue of the uh, CDBG uh, budget, um, you're free to do so. Hello, my name is Christine Besch, and this is Kendra Faulkner. Um, we are part of a local nonprofit called OGO. OH stands for Ohio, and GO because we're a mobile service. And I won't spend too much of your time telling you about what we do, but we currently operate um, by converting FedEx style trucks, and we go right to the homes and um, neighborhood parks of some areas that we've teamed up with the local schools and we've targeted areas that maybe have families that would have a hard time accessing mainstream groups and services, whether that be because they don't have vehicles, transportation, or they can't get out of the house if, they, if there's maybe one grandmother with a lot of children, um, or they have some complex needs, maybe students that are at risk, and we've targeted certain areas and we go to those families, we spend time with them, we build relationships, but we also deliver goods such as school uh, supplies, Christmas packages, gifts and trees, and then we also do events. So um, the truck we currently have, we turn into a bookmobile, and we go right into those um, neighborhoods and those parks, and the kids know us now, so they come out running. And uh, we read with them. They get to come into the mobile library and read. And they actually get to pick out books every time they visit and take them home and keep them. So everything we do, we try to make it so that they can take it home and continue that interaction at home with their families. But the reason we're here is because we're going to be requesting funding uh, with this program because we wish to expand. Um, so we're going to continue to do what we currently do. But we're going to have another team and hopefully another truck. And we're going to go into four different neighborhoods in Sandusky. Um, this year, we're looking at Pioneer Trail, MacArthur Park, Hancock area, and JC. And um, we have learned that, and we all know this, that we have amazing services um, and organizations and businesses in this city. But the people that we have grown to love, that we visit frequently, they might not have access to those, so we are going to take it to them. And we've teamed up and partnered with many different services, the Sandusky Library, Metro Parks, just for instance. Um, and they have all offered, and the police department, hopefully the fire department, and they have all offered and are super excited. I was, we're so blessed to actually have them um, be as excited as they are about this, because we truly are. But they are going to provide some kind of activity that we can do with these families. And the difference is um, these families for this particular program will register. Uh, they will show verification of that low income status. We will be providing grocery, groceries as an incentive through Second Harvest. So they'll get groceries every week for when they come and participate with us. Um, that service will be there to provide an activity, resources, information in a non-threatening manner, just walking around. We have professionals that can answer questions, but it's not so intimidating when we go there. And it's not us just saying, hey, there's this really cool program. It's actually a person coming in and making friends and talking. So it's really cool. And there's also some other incentives involved. So just to give you one example, um, the library, for instance, they're going to come and do a literature-based activity, and our bookmobile will also be there. So we'll be interacting with these families. Um, but for coming, they will get to pick books out of the bookmobile to take home to hopefully um, continue that reading aloud at home. Um, they will get signed up for Imagination Library. So there is a really great service that a lot of these kids aren't getting just because of the paperwork. So we're going to assist with that. So then they're going to get free books mailed to their home every month through that, and then uh, they've said they would offer transportation vouchers, because our hope is that we'll see an increase in these services after this program. So we'll be with them for eight or nine weeks, but our other team, these are locations we go back to. So we will always be there to follow up um, and to stay friends with these families after their program. I just wanted to give you uh, a little information, but we have brochures and we'd love to meet more of you. We're lucky enough to have already met a lot of you, but if you want to talk, we'll be here afterwards. Thank you for allowing us this time.
Thank you. Uh, thank you both for what you do and for bringing forward this idea. Uh, it certainly sounds like something that we should be taking a look at. And uh, Ms. Ms. Blanca is right there, and she's going to be the person to talk to. Uh, we have. <laughs> oh, happy. Okay. Yep. Good. Yep. Okay. Well, well, well um, I think, Commissioners, this is the first time I ever remember. Mr. Waddington, you've been here for a long, long, longer than me. I was out there this summer, correct? Yes. And had some hot dogs and walked in the truck. <laughs> but Mr. Brady made a stop one day. Uh, I think it's great, and I, I fully support you. You know, you know where I'm at. Oh yeah. On this, I'm we appreciate you. You smell the food, and you come running, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I got a weakness. We have to keep that regular attendance. You, know, we'll have pizza pizza <laughs> yeah. you do a good job. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you, buddy. Paul. Ms. Blanca, for the staff, I guess, do have we funded a reading program before? Reading program? Yes. Um, no, not that I am Not aware. since we've been here. No, not since I've been here. Just getting the money built back. My thoughts are that uh, this money is competitive in terms of people that need it. Uh, if you've got data that supports the number of kids that you're going to, that you've uh, interacted with in the past and a plan for enlarging that, I'm very much willing to supportive of the concept of finding some money to do to do that program, to do a program like that. It's not all of the all of the things that you have on your uh, on your table. Uh, I think that would be very important. Uh, one other question, uh, just of staff, do we have uh, how much money other than. Did we not get grants for demolition of houses? Yes, no. I would just say uh, through the commissioner president to Commissioner Poole, um, what I will say is the difference. The Erie County Land <coughs> Bank did secure a $1.1 million grant, okay. uh, which is significant. Okay. The reason why historically the city has put a small amount, I shouldn't say small, I mean 85000 is significant, but there are properties that are privately owned um, or there are emergency demolitions that can't be moved into the land bank for utilization of the neighborhood improvement dollars. Okay. So the, the way that grant works is it has to be owned by the land bank and in a target area. So we, are, we do know that there's houses that need demolition that aren't in target areas and that will never be owned by the land bank or the city, which is why the city still wants to retain a small portion for those six to 10 houses. Okay, I'm looking for money for the reading program. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Blasco. Thank you. Uh, there, is there anyone else present who wishes to, Ms. Blanca, did you have something to add? Okay, oh. no, I was is there, just is there anyone else present who wishes to speak on the CDBG uh, budget? Then this hearing is closed, and thank you, Ms. Blanca, again. Okay, commissioners, we now get to our regular agenda items, and I wonder if someone might care to make a motion to accept the communications from staff recommending various pieces of legislation. So moved. Second. Then a motion, second. Discussion? Without objection, the motion to be approved. In hearing no objection, the motion is approved. We turn to our consent agenda, and we have a long regular agenda and uh, a few items on the consent agenda. First, is there, Commissioner, is there anyone who wishes to have any one of the consent agenda items removed from that agenda? If not, then would someone care to make a motion? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lloyd. I make the motion to accept this con the consent items A through H as presented to the City Commission under consent and shall take effect in accordance with section reflected in the ordinances and or resolutions whether it be in accordance with section 13 or 14 of the City Charter. Second. Then a motion. Second. Discussion? Mr. Kresser, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Murray, might I read the consent oh, agenda items into the record? I'm going to get record? this right uh, eventually, if you would, please. <laughs> Sorry, thank Sorry you. I almost forgot to do it. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, consent agenda item A is a zone map amendment for 2513 Venice Road and 1651 Tiffin Avenue. This is a second reading. Item B is a cost sharing agreement with Erie Soil and Water Conservation District for the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Phase 2 for calendar year 2017. Item C is a change order, the second, it's uh, time extension only, with Underground Utilities Incorporated for the East End Sewer Improvements Project. Item D is a change order, the first one, it's a time extension with Precision Paving Incorporated for the 5th Street Reconstruction Project. Item E is a submerged lands lease for 103 Lurie Lane, confirming the land is not needed for any municipal use and the land use complies with 
regulation of permissible land use in the city of Sandusky. Item F is a submerged land lease for 1107 Cedar Point Road, confirming the land is not needed for any municipal use and that the land use complies with regulation of permissible land use of the, in the city of Sandusky. Item G is authorization to resubmit the bus and bus facilities grant application with the Ohio Department of Transportation for the Sandusky Transit System using section 5339B funding. And item H is a priority use agreement with the Panther Baseball Club for use of Kiwanis Park for the Firelands Interleague Baseball League Program for 2017. Motion and a second. Thank you, Ms. Crusher. It's a motion and second. Unless there are further comments, all the commissioners on the motion, please. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinances, please, and the resolutions. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Those ordinances and resolutions are adopted. Would you present item number one, please, Mrs. Cressy? Can you give me that? You don't have it either. Hold on. Yes, we got. I have, have one without it. Where we start? One thirty something. One. What? For, what? for the regular gun items in our, in our packet, was it start? One ten. One ten. Thank you. I left it off. Yes. Want to read? Yeah. Just yeah. Got I got it. Sorry. I got a I'm just trying to see where it starts. Okay. <clears throat> Item one is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Osborne Engineering of Cleveland, Ohio for, for professional design services for the Shoreline Drive Rehabilitation <clears throat> Project, declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Mr. Tavis, here is communication. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Waddington. the adoption of this ordinance be passed at second reading in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. Been a motion and second. Discussion? Mr. C Mr. Chairman, Mr. Poole. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, as we can see from uh, uh, what's generally been planned, or appears to be planned for this, is a, a uh, large we call it a walkway on the back of the houses on Shoreline Drive is what's been seen in conceptual drawings. And as we can see from Mrs. Thompson who came to the, to the uh, podium that there are some concerns about parking in that area. And so I, I just have a couple questions, a question to ask. Uh, I suppose of the manager. With regard to like any of the buildings there, have we had conversations with owners that indicate that they actually want a boardwalk on the back of the building? like? Dr. Gallagher's office, for example, have we had conversation with Dr. Gallagher's office? Through the commission president to Commissioner Poole, we had extensive public process and have talked to several building owners, not every building owner along Water Street, but I think it's important that even in the, um, the selection process for the firm that was ultimately chosen Osborne to do this, that only one of, while it was the option uh, adopted in the comprehensive plan, that is only one of probably at least three options that we'll look at because it will be very technically difficult potentially to do that boardwalk. So yes, there's been public process. No, that public process has not been uh, has not been ubiquitous in in its ability to reach every uh, property owner along Water Street. And but we also know that only one of the options, and again, the public process is only beginning. Only one of the options would include actually doing a boardwalk continuously along Shoreline Drive. Okay, I understand. I've been through public process. Just which building owners have you talked to so you have a general idea what we're talking about here? Uh, we've spoken with the owners of the Reber building. Uh, we've spoken with the Windows. We've spoken with Bob Hare. We've spoken with uh, uh, condo owners within the Hubbard building, not every condo owner in the Hubbard building. Um, I'm trying to think who's spoken with uh, the trustees of the Ruth Parker uh, Foundation that owns property. So we've had a, you know, again, I can't, uh, 
on the spot answer questions. Well, no, no, that's fine. You don't have to be that detailed. I'm trying to get a concept of this because ultimately, when we get finished with this, we spend a lot of money for design of something that if a property owner says you can't connect to this building, we have a problem. And voting to do this in the fashion that we're doing is, I'm not sure, is, is, is a wise choice and enough said about it. So through the commission president to Commissioner Poole, why we structured this process in this way was actually so that we could do engineering to look at several options and have a public process in which we could select a conceptual plan on which to move forward. So the ability to determine what treatment is necessary at Shoreline Drive, this is a condition precedent to being able to understand A, what is feasible from an engineering perspective, and B, what is the concept that the public desires to see go forward on Shoreline. So there's no way for us to answer those questions without a proposal that allows us to look technically at what would be required to move forward. Other questions or comments, commissioners? I will be abstaining on the second reading, uh, the second vote, as I did on the first one, because my office is right across from this. Mr. Cressy, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. I'm sorry, on, uh, on the legislation, excuse me. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Abstain. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Abstain. Mr. Poole? No. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number two, please. Item two is a request for the commission clerk to notify the Ohio Division of Liquor Control. The city has no objection to a Trex liquor permit transfer of D1, D2, D3, D3A, and D6 liquor permits from M&J Hospitality, LLC, doing business as MG's Tavern and Fine Food in Hamilton, Ohio, to Zeller Baby, LLC, 142 Columbus Avenue. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that the Commission Clerk Kelly Crescent notify the Ohio Department of Liquor Control that the city has no objections to the Trex TREX liquor permit transfer. Second. It's been a motion and second. Discussion? Ms. Crescent, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Motion passes. Item number three, please. Item three is an ordinance approving the Sandusky Landmark Commission's designation of the Whitworth Building located at 234 to 236 Columbus Avenue, parcel number 56-01247.000, Sandusky, Ohio, as a local landmark, and declaring that this ordinance shall take effect under the suspension of the rules as contained in and in accordance with Section 13 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lloyd. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules and in full accordance with Section 13 of the City Charter. Second. It's been a motion and second. Discussion. Just, uh, just, just, just quickly, I wanted to ask staff, we asked at the uh, Planning Commission that the uh, information that was provided with this, the booklet that talked about the Whitworth Building, be uh, placed someplace that the public could get access to it. Where did you ultimately uh, end up with that? The library, hopefully? We actually have it on our website at this point. We have not gotten it to the reference section of the library yet, but we plan on contacting them, yes. Just wanted to say, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, the story of that building is extreme, and the gentleman who is named after is very compelling and uh, worthwhile reading. It is. I suggest you take an opportunity to read it. Ms. Sparks, anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members of the commission. I think um, Commissioner Poole, um, you know, touched briefly on it. Obviously, the applicant is Maroos um, Brothers LLC, um, and they have applied to locally landmark the Whitworth Building. Uh, John Whitworth was a, a huge impact to the city of Sandusky. And just again, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll read you a quote um, within volume three of the history of the Western Reserve. It was noted that in the death of John Whitworth, Sandusky lost one of his oldest and best known and most valued citizens. Many business enterprises here owe their excellence and progress largely to his influence and what he did for his fellow citizens. 
and for Sandusky, and his far-reaching influence cannot be told. Uh, so again, um, planning staff obviously recommends approval of the local landmarking this building. Um, and just to note, planning commission on February 1st unanimously also recommend approval to a local landmark this building. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, questions or comments? Ms. Gresser, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Cole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number four, please. Item four is an ordinance declaring that certain real property owned by the city as part of the land reutilization program identified as parcel number 58-02370.000 located at 1017 Putnam Street, Sandusky is no longer needed for any municipal purpose and authorizing the execution of a purchase and sale agreement with respect to that real property and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Twine. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Second. The motion is second. Questions? Discussion? Mr. Jordan here. Congratulations, sir, and good luck to you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wannickson. And then in uh, reading this, I'm excited, and congratulations, that he's uh, proposed a $17,877.49 rehab project, three years to occupy, so it's going from rental to home ownership. That's exciting. I wish we could get more and more projects like that, so I wish you the best and good luck with that. Okay, thank you. Is there something else? Mrs. Crestor, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. No on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number five, please. Item number five is an ordinance approving a second supplement to the compensation agreement with Sandusky City School District, authorizing and directing the city manager to execute an agreement extending the use of Chesapeake TIF funds into the second urban renewal area and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Twine. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with section 14 of the city charter. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Discussion. <clears throat> Ms. Byington, do you want to walk us through this piece of legislation, if you would, please? Sure. Thank you, Mr. President, members of commission. As Ms. Kresser stated, the purpose of the second supplement is to allow for the use of the Chesapeake TIF funds not only in the existing urban renewal area, but also now in the second urban renewal area, which has been recently adopted. The eligible projects for the use of the funds will continue to be urban renewal projects that help eliminate and prevent the spread of blight. Uh, projects include, but are not limited to, the installation, construction, or reconstruction of streets, utilities, parks, playgrounds, demolition, property acquisition, rehabilitation, and conservation. The schools have approved the supplement, and there is no impact to the budget. Commissioners, questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Just Ms. Walker. Do you, uh, do you have any idea of what you might be using it on right now? In specific, any, any projects or anything? There are no had? specific projects. Um, they will. The projects would follow the same rules. You know, the, it, depending on the amount of the project would come before commission for approval before we enter into contract. But in general, the thought is, you know, where the second urban renewal area is, is where we believe that there will more than likely be development and inv investment. So, um, you know, between Jackson, Jackson Street Pier, I guess, is one area that we are going to be using the funds. And I, I sorry that I didn't say that right off the bat, but that is definitely somewhere that we're looking to use the funds for the Jackson Street Pier and for Shoreline Drive. So those are the two first projects that we're looking at at this time. Okay. Further questions or comments? 
Mr. Chairman, cool. although in general I uh, agree with the concept of using TIF money for improvements in the uh, overall area, I'm not co comfortable that, um, that the money that we are adequately interacting with the community for making decisions about what we spend that on. I don't find Jackson Street Pier to be a revenue producing uh, project. It's going to take an extremely large amount of money to do anything more with it. And so for that reason that we're just not laying out a plan that makes any sense, it ties to uh, Mr. Lockhart's question about what are you going to spend it on, uh, I consider this, I'm, going to, I'm just going to vote no. Further questions or comments? I am going to abstain from this piece of legislation because I didn't ask the Ohio Ethics Commission fast enough if I could vote on this. But I think that I can, Mr. Hughes, <coughs> because it's simply expanding the area that already exists across the street from my office. But I'd rather be sure, so I'm going to abstain. Okay, unless there are further questions or comments, Ms. Kresser, would you poll the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Abstain. Mr. Poole? No. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Abstain. Mr. Poole? No. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted, right, Mr. Harris? Correct. Okay, we got, we got it. Aside. Item number six, please. Item 6 is a resolution declaring the necessity for the city to proceed with the proposed wayfinding and signage project, approving the specifications and engineer's estimate of cost thereof, and directing the city manager to advertise for and receive bids in relation thereto, and declaring that this resolution shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the city charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Twa Ms. Uh, Floyd. I move for the adoption of this resolution under the suspension of the rules and in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. Then a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Klein, sure. do you want to give us an overview? Or Mr. Brady, do you have something? I, I, I will jump in prior to an Please. overview or discussion. And uh, as I have in the last two or three occasions on this, this is my turn to abstain on an item uh, due to a business that I own that may be uh, bidding on this project. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Sir, Mr. President, this is uh, the wayfinding project that we've been talking about now for about a year and a half to two years. So we're finally to the point where we're ready to bid it. Um, close. We have to get ODOT's approval, but one of the steps, the next step is to get permission from our city commission, send that down to ODOT so that they can sign off on the bidding process. So even though it gets approved tonight, it would uh, probably still be about a month before we'd see it out on the streets, and I expect construction to start somewhere around uh, summer. What this project is, uh, for those that might have it, is there are signs that are going to be going in throughout the entire city to help uh, tourists, commuters, anybody that comes to the city be able to see, to be able to get around the town, be able to get to marinas, get to museums, uh, the hospital, different locations that were agreed upon and approved by the steering committees that were, uh, that, that spent about a year going over it and, and figuring out what needed to be uh, on these, these destination locations. So. Um, if anybody has any more questions without getting too much into detail, I know we've had presentations and other things on it, so uh, without getting into too much detail, I'd be happy to answer any other questions. I do think it's important to note, Mr. Klein, that uh, we really get um, a lot of leverage out of the funding on this particular project. Um, and uh, while the city is investing $150,000, the balance of this more than uh, a, a half million dollars, five dollars to $65,000, uh, project is coming from uh, private businesses, Lake Erie Shores and Islands, and ODOT. So, um, Firelands Regional Medical Center is contributing fifty thousand, and Cedar Fair is contrib contributing fifty thousand, uh, one hundred sixty-five thousand from the MPO ODOT funds, and then one hundred fifty thousand dollars from Lake Erie Shores and Islands. So, uh, that's a great um, coalition that was put together to support that funding and, and I think a, a program is going to have far-reaching and long-term consequences for the city. Um, one more thing that I would like to add, I apologize, um, one more thing that I would like to add is one of the things that we are going to be installing are going to be several kiosks in the downtown area 
That way, people that might be getting off at the transient marina, people that might be finding their way downtown, we will have these kiosks located around for those people, those pedestrians that are on foot or on, or on their bikes. Um, we, because we will have access to the artwork that would be going onto those kiosks, the maps that would be going onto those kiosks, we can also put them at other locations, um, you know, maybe in the county building or uh, get some flyers, things like that for businesses that may want to have these things there so that they can, people can come in, get to that business and find their way around. Fingers crossed. If there's questions or comments. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Poole. Uh, I tend to read things literally, so I just need a clarification. Uh, total cost of planning, design, inspection, and advertising. Which one of those words covers puts the signs up? The planning, design. Inspection and advertising is $575,000. I'm trying to make sure that this gets signs put up. Yes. <laughs> Those words didn't cover it for me. Okay. Construction. I left that off. Oh, that. Okay. <laughs> Aaron made Thank a you. mistake. Put it down. Uh, can we? Can we do the ad. That's a good one. Can we add construction to the motion to make this work? Well, this is covered in the uh, legislation. Okay. I, 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 at the top, it wasn't either. No, I read it at the beginning. It's not. That's why I, I checked it twice. But okay. I'm happy if you are. I'm happy. All you, right. You good, Mr. Harris? Yep. Okay. All right. As long as he says we're okay, we're okay. All right. Yeah. You get the bill if you're wrong. <laughs> Further questions or comments? <laughs> Chris, would you call the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poore? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Abstain. And now on the resolution? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Abstain. That resolution is adopted. Item number seven, please. Item seven is a resolution declaring the necessity for the city to pro proceed with the proposed Columbus Avenue underpair, underpass repair project, approving the specifications and engineer's estimate of cost thereof, and directing the city manager to advertise for and receive bids in relation thereto, and declaring that this resolution shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Chairman. Ms. Toyne. I move for the adoption of this resolution under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. We've got a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Klein, I take it you think it's a better idea to repair these things and uh, maintain the underpasses instead of waiting to the point that they crumble when it costs a couple million dollars to repair them. Yes, sir. It's like a good idea to me. So glad you're on top of this. Now, further questions or comments? Mr. Scrusser, would you poll the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the resolution. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That resolution is adopted. Item number eight, please. Item eight is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to enter into an agreement with T&M Associates of Cleveland, Ohio, for professional environmental services in conjunction with the U.S. EPA Brownfields grant received from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules and in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. And a motion, second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waddington. In reading through this, uh, I was happy to see that the city's going to reestablish Brownfields program. That was previously uh, very effective. Uh, in the past, they did demolitions of Apex, Dusky Cabinets, Paper Dusty Gary, the old City Ice Building, Jackson Street Parking Lot, Deepwater and many other sites. So I'm glad that we are doing this. It's going to be fully funded for the round table, correct? Okay. Glad it's back. The round table. So. Further questions or comments? <coughs> Ms. Crusher, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? 
Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number nine, please. Item number nine is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to approve the first change order for work performed by Hanks Plumbing and Heating Company Incorporated of Toledo, Ohio, for the Big Island Waterworks Emergency Intake Rehabilitation and Chemical Feed Line Installation Project in the amount of $7,486.56 and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Mr. having heard this communication, what is your pleasure? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Twine. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. Been a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Klein, I guess uh, basically you had to swap out some pipes and uh, um, make them a little bit larger. And then this is this is the crib. This is the secondary intake crib. And um, we found some some decay of the, I guess the break wall, if you will, around that, and, and much of the expense is really due to fortifying that. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. President, this is um, this is one of those projects where the contractor was very diligent in helping and making sure that we uh, got a quality job at the end. Um, we. When, when they put in the coffer dam and pumped it out, they realized that the dike that was out there that holds in the cells for the ODNR site was actually what was falling into and uh, all the debris was what was plugging and getting into the emergency intake. Not necessarily plugging, but at least getting into the emergency intake. So during construction, uh, they asked if we wanted to just take the sheet metal that was used for that coffer dam and use it as a retaining wall for that dike. So it worked out to be a very uh, good proposal by the, the contractor, something that since he already had the materials, they were brand new materials, we wanted to make sure that uh, not only were we were protecting that investment in that infrastructure that we had, but we were also protecting the, the park that we have out there that you know, in the future we want to make sure that we are planning for. So um, this was something that's, that's one of the items on here. We also wanted to make sure that uh, something that will be coming down the road is some safety, hand railing, and things like that. But we wanted to make sure that, that all the equipment that we're installing was easily accessible and that was obviously the appropriate size. So that's what this change order entails. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Mr. Cresser, would you poll the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number 10, please. Item 10 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to purchase four low floor 20 passenger buses from American Bus and Accessories Incorporated of Cincinnati, Ohio, and one light transit vehicle from Bus Service Incorporated of Canal Winchester, Ohio, through the State of Ohio Department of Transportation Cooperative Purchasing Program for the Sandusky Transit System and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lloyd. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules and in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. It's been a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Randleson, I see you here. Yes, I Thanks am. for being here, sir. Uh, could you walk us through this piece of legislation? And while you're up at the podium, why don't you talk about the next one, which also uh, pertains to the Sinusky Transit okay. System? Absolutely. Um, through you, Mr. President. Uh, these five vehicles will replace vehicles that we originally received in 2010, which have reached the end of their useful lives. Um, these will be full, solely used on Spark, so they're dedicated to our bus stop service, and they will be badged and used as such. Um, it's important that our fleet is one of the oldest in the state, and through the investments we've made in 2016 and 2017, we're drastically reducing the age of that fleet, making it more cost-effective to operate and uh, more pleasant for our riders as well. Um, the second item is a comprehensive transportation agreement with the Sandusky City Schools. 
this agreement entails both Dialerite, group trips, and also bus stop service through Spark. So students that are unable to use the current school bus service will be able to use our bus stop service to get to school. In addition, those students will also be able to use uh, Spark to get to jobs or to internship programs through the school district. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the first piece of legislation, I think it's important to note that 90% of that is grant funded. Yes, sir. Uh, and we have a 10% local match. And the second uh, uh, contract, I, I really applaud you for bringing that forward. That's something we've been talking about for a long time. It's a demonstration of the level of cooperation that we're experiencing between the city and the school system. Uh, this will provide uh, uh, students with a lot of different options after school or internships, as you noted, uh, in order to be able to get about the city when the, when the school buses aren't available to them. So it's really great that we're doing that. Questions or comments on the, well, I should, I should have limited my comments to the first piece of legislation, I apologize. But questions or comments on uh, the, the, the grant, or excuse me, the purchase of the buses? Mr. Chairman. Brady. Mr. Randleson, these, these are new buses, are they not? These aren't beaters, are they? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> in the past, we bought old buses before, Year, years ago. It, yeah, I know. It was never, it was never a good, uh, it never turned out too well for us. Yeah. I'm, I'm pleased that we're buying new buses. Me too. <laughs> Further questions or comments? Mrs. Cressy, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number 11, please. Item 11 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to enter into an agreement for transportation services between the city of Sandusky and the Sandusky City Schools for services related to the Sandusky Transit System and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman, Ms. Twine. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. It's been a motion and second. Discussion. Mrs. Cresser, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And no on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number 12, please. Item 12 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to expend the necessary funds for the purchase and installation of fencing from Fremont Fence and Guardrail Company of Fremont, Ohio for the Erie Blacktop Field Fence Replacement Project and declaring that this ordinance, ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Twine. I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. There's been a motion and second. Discussion. Ms. Kurt, to you here, would you like to present the uh, legislation and tell us, uh, uh, give us the specifics about this great improvement to our parks, long anticipated. Sure, through you, Mr. President. Um, we had Leadership Erie County, class of 2016. They raised funds um, around like 12,000 to improve the park at Ambets, uh, or the field at Ambets Park. And then also Erie Blacktop donated $10,000. So that together, the fencing is, is the major thing they wanted to focus on. So we did the bid process and um, then we ended up having to get quotes. Thank you. Um, that would go in for the spring season, I hope. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, with this, um, the quotes, they have to have it done by May 1st. Okay. All right. Thank you. Questions or comments, Commissioners? Ms. Cresser, would you pull the Commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted, and uh, with it, uh, we'd like to extend our thanks again to Erie Blacktop and the Leadership Erie County class who um, 
provided for all those funds to improve the park. So thanks to both. Thanks to both. Ms. Cresser, would you present item number 13, please? Yes, item 13 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to purchase <coughs> playground equipment and associated surfacing from David Williams and Associates, Game Time of Alliance Ohio, for Alliance Park, and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wattles, I move for the adoption of this ordinance under suspension of the rules in full accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Second. Been a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady. I wonder if Mr. Lenka just share with us. Uh, I, I, I believe that we put this playground equipment together, don't we? Yeah. And, and we're getting pretty good at that because we've done it several times now. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the second question is, uh, I, I'm, I think we have your assurance and have in the past had your assurance that none of this equipment is going to be lost or wasted or, or uh, not, not used with any kind of reconfiguration that goes on uh, with this park. Yes, through you, Commissioner President, to Commissioner Brady. So, what would, so let me ask you, you mean in the park we're not adding to what's currently there? Yes. Okay, so no, we are not doing that. Okay. Uh, part of the Lions Park overall project, this is, I guess, part of the phase two, let's call it, and that the new park is going to go over by the splash pad on the north side of the splash pad. Um, the current existing newer portion, uh, the little playground we put on the walk bike path will remain. Okay. The older equipment where the drive is going to go off of LaSalle Street, I believe it is, mm -hmm. um, where that drive is going to go, we're taking that equipment out. And so to replace the old equipment, we're building brand new equipment brand new. over by the current uh, ADA swings and the basketball courts, but bad, bad. Great. Good plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are your comments, commissioners? Mrs. Cresser, would you follow the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. And now on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number 14. <coughs> Item 14 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to purchase 15 cruiser mobile video systems and accessories through the State of Ohio Cooperative Purchasing Program from L3 Mobile Vision Incorporated of Rockaway, New Jersey for the police department and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman, I move for the adoption of this ordinance under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Second. It's been a motion and second. Discussion. Chief, you want to walk us through what uh, we're about to undertake here? Um, thank you, Mr. President. The uh, cruisers have been, had video audio systems back to the 2006 era, and some of the components that have been in those cruisers have been in there since uh, we purchased them. In 2011, we ended up uh, changing the DVRs, which is the storage for those, but the camera systems and all that, uh, the wire harnesses all remained in place, so all of them have been there for 11 years. So we're wanting to upgrade all of the systems. Uh, back when we first purchased them, we only had 14 <coughs> cruisers, now we have another K9 cruiser, so that's 15. Um, the commission had uh, given us permission to apply for a grant, which we did receive. So one of those systems will be paid for out of a grant and actually just found out um, that we did a waiver for the 25% match and they gave it to us. So they're going to give us the full amount of the system. So it's a little bit more money. But the money is coming out of Education and Enforcement Fund, which is um, generally collected through the courts and deposited for um, enforcement and education through OVI uh, fees and, and that. So that's what we used in 06. We're going to use that money and uh, we saved some capital money because we had that budget in the, for the capital, but we're not going to need that money. So essentially the capital um, investments are going to be about $11,000. Um, uh, Stu's around here somewhere. Yeah. So in the company, we've had such a good relationship with them. They're giving us an extended uh, maintenance warranty. So the normal is like one year and then we pay. Um, they're giving us three years, which is 
dollars savings. So um, back in 2006, I think we spent about 118,000. So it's a lot cheaper even uh, with the technology. It's all HD um, camera systems. So uh, we think we're going to get a good package. And obviously, it's uh, one of the most essential tools that we have uh, in today's era. So we uh, strongly uh, encourage that we replace all of that. Thank you, Chief. Questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Grady. Chief, again, we're relying on Mr. Vaccaro to, to install this yes. product. Yes, sir. They'll uh, come in. The uh, canine car that we're waiting on, uh, we asked them to stop so we can get this new system, um, which we'll get in. And um, indications are that the equipment will be here two to four weeks. He can go forward on that, and then he'll change those out as we, uh, as he has time to do. So um, they have a pretty good grasp on it. And, and the purpose for my mentioning that, both the playground equipment and with, with this more sophisticated equipment, is to point out that, that our our employees have the ability to do that. Not every not every city does that. It does a couple things. It saves us money, and more importantly, it saves us time. Those cameras, those devices, that playground equipment will be on the street, be in the cars much sooner with our own people installing them. Absolutely. So uh, kudos to uh, to staff for uh, for being able to provide that kind of service for us. It, it is quite a quite a uh, attribute for us. Additional questions or comments. Professor, Mr. Paul, the commissioners on the motion, please. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Ms. Brady? Yes. Are on the ordinance? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted. Item number 15, <clears throat> our last item. <laughs> Yes. Item 15 is an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to purchase one Lucas 2.2 chest compression system from Physio Control Incorporated of Redmond, Washington, through the State of Ohio Cooperative Purchasing Program, and declaring that this ordinance shall take immediate effect in accordance with Section 14 of the City Charter. Commissioners, having heard this communication, how do you wish to proceed? Mr. Chairman. Twice. For the adoption of this ordinance yeah. under the suspension of the rules in full accordance with section 14 of the city charter. Second. And a motion and second. Discussion? Mr. Chairman. Uh, in my, thank you. In my time as the uh, liaison of the fire department, I was able to see this device firsthand, and it seems to be an amazing device to help save lives by uh, mimicking the compressions that a firefighter or a first responder would give uh, to the chest of an individual that would be in so need. And of course, uh, the chief could speak to it greater than I could, but I think this is something that we should definitely have, if not have more of them, uh, in our department. Uh, very good life saving advice. Chief. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Lockhart, uh, in the audience, the uh, all fire departments, all EMS providers are, uh, we fall under, we follow the rules of the American Heart Association, and if anybody here has gone to school, and maybe some of us are a little bit older, but we've probably taken a CPR class uh, growing up. Um, CPR is a very easy skill uh, to learn, but oftentimes what they've found through years of study is that we, rescuers, actually advanced life support providers, uh, we stop for more than 50% of the time of the total time that we're with somebody who's in a cardiac arrest uh, for various reasons, whether it's fatigue or whether it's because we have to shock the patient or start an IV on them and give them medications. So uh, this is not... Th the device is not a new device. It's been out for a while, for some for some years, but they've perfected it. And Captain Butler, uh, about six months ago, uh, working through uh, this company, uh, was able to get a loaner for us, and they've actually perfected it. And what it is, it, it almost looks like something that you put over your child, uh, your baby, as they're they're trying to reach up and, and swat the, the little toys that are hanging down, except this has a plunger on it uh, and a very sophisticated computer and motor on it that is programmed uh, to to supply uh, the right amount of compressions, uh, whether we have what we call an advanced airway in place or whether it's just somebody uh, uh, doing 30 compressions to two breaths. Uh, and uh, it stops for us, it starts, and, and it actually... <coughs> 
compresses to the proper depth. Uh, and we've noticed that doing our field trials that it is perfect CPR. It never tires. It doesn't call off sick. All we have to do is keep the battery charged. Uh, and the American Heart Association does recommend it for pre-hospital uh, providers because it is an extra helping hand. So uh, I'm waiting on the numbers, actually. Uh, I'm a bit, they are a bit behind in getting them to me, but uh, we do know that we've never had anything bad happen uh, from it, and we do know that actually, uh, if seeing it, especially out at Cedar Point, uh, that there is, uh, we've had one case uh, specifically that it has helped with. So uh, what we do is we want to purchase one right now, uh, and we want to put it on our main fire engine down at the number one fire station, because that responds to all cardiac rest. And uh, we're going to go from there. And like Mr. Lockhart said, and if it does work out, uh, yes, it would be a very useful tool for us. And, and we know that a $17,000 purchase is quite a, uh, uh, not a large, large purchase, but it's still a lot of money. But we would appreciate you approving that, and we can put it into use. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah, it may be costing $17,000, but there's no price on a human life that it might save. So I'm fully in support of that. And, and if I may add one more thing, I'd like to really uh, extend my gratitude to the Whiteman Weaver Foundation for giving us that grant and, and just uh, with the ability to see that there is something that can help everybody in the city of Sandusky. And, and we'd like to thank them very much for their generosity. Thanks, Chief. Further questions or comments, Commissioners? Mr. Cresser, would you pull the Commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. Now on the ordinance. Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That ordinance is adopted, and that concludes our regular agenda items. We turn the floor over to you, Mr. Wilkeser, for the city manager's report. Thank you, Commissioner President, Murray, Commissioners, uh, audience, and staff. I'm going to start tonight's city manager's report with two pieces of news, one really exciting uh, that most of us are aware of and, and one that is bittersweet. Uh, the exciting piece is, is probably almost everyone in this room knows is that Governor Kasich announced today that he intends to seek uh, approval from the state legislature to bring the state of the state address to Sandusky on April 4th. and and. Uh, we want to give a huge thank you uh, to the State Theater for partnering to host that event, as well as to Senator uh, Gardner and State Representative Steve Arndt, who we know with uh, out the great support of the governor they, that this event would not be possible. Uh, there will be a lot of logistics. We're learning more. We've had a few meetings and calls even as of today uh, to talk about what that will mean for Sandusky, but what we know it is is a really great opportunity to build a partnership with the state and to, to seek out all the partners who've been with us over the last several years to really showcase all the amazing things that are happening in the city. Uh, we did hear from the state that, in part, uh, things that they wanted to showcase here, in addition to Lake Erie, uh, the health of the lake and the tourism economy and all the great things that this area has to offer, included uh, just how much we've been able to partner with the state on specific initiatives, ranging from the state historic tax credits uh, that the state awarded for our uh, administrative offices project with vintage development. Uh, to the Sunoco gas station grant. We aggressively pursued that to the million dollar grant for the Sandusky Bay planning uh, that we'll be undertaking over the course of the next year. And uh, in addition to that, the, the grant will be able to showcase directly at the State Theater for capital repairs. So we've been taking advantage of the programs the state does offer uh, and, and know that there will be a lot of work over those next month and a half to make it possible. But, but this is a really great opportunity and I think is a reflection of the leadership that the commission has shown uh, over the past three years to uh, really put Sandusky on the map and move it forward in a way that other cities can emulate and that the state can showcase. So congratulations to everyone who's involved. And again, a thank you to the governor, our state representative and senator, uh, and all those who will be involved in, in making this possible in Sandusky. So moving on to the more bittersweet <laughs> news, uh, and it really is both bitter and sweet, is uh, Dave Degnan has let us know that after 20 years of service uh, in our fire department, and two years uh, of uh, two years plus of service as our chief, uh, going on three years actually, uh, he's going to retire. And and um, you know Dave is leaving the department in a better place than we found it. Uh, he inherited it during a very difficult time, a lot of, uh, around the same time that a lot of you were dealing with those same issues uh, as city commissioners. Uh, but he struggled through uh, those difficult 
times financially. He worked through and, and assisted the department in passing issue eight. He has uh, continued to show leadership in a union negotiation last year. And what we think, in addition to the many things he's accomplished, a, a crowning achievement, uh, we recently received word that uh, our rating uh, from the insurance providers or the ISO, which ha happens once every five or ten years, has actually been upgraded to a level uh, of which we've not achieved in the past and, and puts us in a really high percentage uh, of, of, of fire departments. So our, our fire department is being left uh, better than Dave found it. Uh, but again, um, we're very happy for him, even as we're saddened to see somebody who's been a really important part of the progress the last few years uh, move on to, to, to see family and to take advantage of their personal life. So we want to give Dave a big round of applause for his service. I, I do want to add this. Uh, you know, I had someone, uh, this, this spread pretty quickly sure. throughout the city, and so someone said today, to me today, they said they could not believe that you were old enough to retire. Shave <laughs> <laughs> the gray off. I, what's that? I shave the gray off as much well, as I can. <laughs> make, make, make sure you ask him for that youth serum that he, that he uses. There's got to be something like that. So. Uh, congratulations, and thanks, Chief. Is this your last meeting? No. Uh, no, the 27th will be my last meeting, if, and if I could just take a couple seconds. I just wanted to extend my thank you very much to the... Uh, commission, um, it has been an honor to work for you, and the older I get, the softer I get, so hopefully I can make it through this. Um, and to Mr. Whoopser and the rest of the, the city staff, you guys have been incredible, and I think that, uh, and I'll talk about uh, my re interim replacement here in a second, but I also wanted to say thank you to the citizens of, of uh, Sandusky. I, I, when I came here 20 years ago, I, I grew up in Chicago, and I thought, ah, Sandusky, Ohio. Like, what's in Sandusky, Ohio? So, but it actually turned out that that I have met the most incredible people here, and um, we I've seen a lot of very good things. I've accomplished a lot. I think I've helped people. I've seen some very tragic things, as we all have, And uh, but I've always felt compassion uh, for the people in this town that, that needed it the most. And I always thought that was the most important thing that I could do is, you know, somebody, I remember, um, you know, helping, you know, older women uh, that were by themselves, you know, they would go to the bathroom on themselves in the middle of the night and they had no, no family, so you would, you would help change them. And I remember one firefighter said, well, I don't know if I got into it for this. And I said, well, that's, you know, I did. I mean, I just liked helping people like that, reading lottery tickets for people, uh, fighting fires. And I think that uh, you talk to any firefighter, uh, most of the firefighters, and they would say the same thing. And I think it, all of us ha have a passion, but I was just very fortunate that when, that, uh, when I tested, I was, uh, I remember uh, sitting in one of the, the interviews, and, and it was from the Human Relations Commission, I think, uh, and they said, you know, you'll, you'll get hired on, and that was actually the best thing for me. So I just wanted to say that, that thank you very much. Uh, you guys are incredible. I'm fiercely, fiercely loyal to Sandusky. I never liked it when anybody ever said anything bad about Sandusky, if any of the other towns, and I don't want to slam any other towns, but they're so much better. Uh, this is an incredible town, and it is from 20 years ago, even then, with all the hardships that everybody had to work through, something finally came right, and we all came together, and, and things are really, you know, taken off. So I just also wanted to introduce, if, if uh, Kenton D'Amico could stand up for a second, you probably all know Mario. He walks around his his, uh, his paint splattered jeans with his wife and kids all the time, dragging five kids behind. Uh, <laughs> Captain D'Amico has been on the fire department for uh, 19 years, came out on about a year after I have. Captain D'Amico, uh, we thought, would be a good interim uh, chief right now. Captain D'Amico, and you all know him, uh, he's... He's, again, fiercely loyal to Sandusky. Uh, he is a great firefighter. He can be really nasty when he wants to be nasty, but he can be very politically correct when he wants to be, and he's quiet, and he <laughs> shuts up, and he listens to you, but he's not afraid to tell you what you need to hear. Um, and I think that uh, he's helped me out a lot, and uh, I think that he'll be a very good addition uh, as the interim chief, and hopefully he'll think about taking the position. So, right. Good luck to you, Captain. Thank you. Thank you. Commission President Murray will have a little bit to, to discuss with you later about the, the search process and how that goes under the city charter. Uh, but again, I just want to say uh, thank you to Dave uh, for your service. Uh, one of the first decisions.
that I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to make upon starting as the city manager, I think it was my second day on the job, was to interview and hire Dave. Uh, he was one of, of just a few finalists that uh, Commissioner Twine and her committee uh, recommended for the fire chief position, and, and they really teed me up with an early, uh, with an early uh, uh, softball. And, and Dave, thank you so much for your service. And You're welcome. We look thank forward you. to your last few weeks and a continued relationship. And Mario, I look forward to working with you in, in your new role. So thank you. So moving on with dry eyes for the most part um, uh, to donations. I wanted to ask the commission for a motion to accept. A $7,500 donation from the City of Vermilion and Vermilion Community Services for supporting transit in Erie County. So moved. Second. Uh, it's just $17,500 on the yeah. report. Yeah, he said 17000 17000 okay, thank you. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. Then a motion and a second. Without objection, the motion will be approved. And hearing no objection, the motion is approved with our thanks uh, for that support. Well, well deserved and... and uh, Appreciated support for Sandusky Transit. Absolutely. Uh, also, one more donation of $200 from Randall Harris and Mary Ann Coburn for the Canine Fund. I'd ask for a motion to accept that donation. So moved. Second. It's been a motion and second discussion. Without objection, the motion will be approved. And hearing no objection, the motion is approved with our thanks. Thank you. Moving on to administration, new and old business. I'd like to ask the commission for a motion to pay the fiscal year uh, March of 17. Uh, through February of 18 dues for the Erie County Chamber of Commerce in the amount of three hundred and seventy nine dollars So moved. second Been a motion and second discussion Without objection the motion will be approved and hearing no objection. The motion is approved. Thank you moving on to the police department Detective John Hoffman has retired effective February 3rd of 2017 we thank him for his years of service at the department his military years as an army ranger and wish him well in his future endeavors uh, Eric Costante, our community impact officer, has been reassigned to the Detective Bureau to fill the vacancy of uh, Detective Huffman. Also, Bronson Willow, in the chain of, a, of, of dominoes, I guess, has been reassigned as the community impact officer position effective February 9th, 2017. So we want to congratulate Detective Huffman uh, as well as uh, Eric and Bronson for their promotions. Chief, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Nothing. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the finance department, the state auditor's financial health indicator report for Sandusky 2015 is available. The report measured 17 financial health indicators, uh, and there are no critical outlook indicators, uh, only two cautionary outlook indicators. The remaining indicators were all noted as positive outlook. So this, again, uh, you know, is a sign of strong financial position and financial management within the city. Uh, also, we were contacted in a, an example, I think, of the reputation of the finance department in late January. Uh, Erie County Sheriff Paul Sigsworth and the village of Milan Police Chief reached out to Director Soloway about possible irregularities involving uh, the village and uh, our ability to assist them in paying their employees, issuing W-2s, and paying vendors. We informed them that we would be able to assist because we uh, both use the same software system and, and we currently are still assisting as they, they continue that investigation until they can get back on their feet. Uh, the Finance Committee will meet on Friday, February 24th, 2017 at 7.45 a.m. in the Commission Chambers, as well as on Friday, March 24th at 7.45 a.m. also in the Commission Chambers. And Public Works. Uh, after successful completion of the two lift stations for the East End Sewer Project, one at Farwell and the other at East Oldgate, they were considered officially operational on January 20th. The contractor will return in the spring to plant grass and perform other minor punch list items. Also, Manic and Smith will perform a phase one environmental site assessment at the old Sunoco site for the fourth tank that was discovered during excavation. Staff plans to move forward with the phase one and asbestos, asbestos assessment at the former Myers Winery on Campbell Street. Combined costs for these two projects are approximately $20,000 to be paid wholly from the Brownfields grant that we received, I believe, also from the state last year. Uh, community development, there will be public meetings, our public meeting regarding transient rentals on February 15th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. at Sandusky High School, room 300. City staff will present general alternatives regarding regulations and public input will be sought. Uh, also, there will be a public meeting and informational session regarding the city's 2017 housing development beautification programs on February 15th between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. The meeting will be held at the Central Fire Station training room located at 600 West Market Street. Property owners and contractors are encouraged to attend. 
Staff will be present to summarize programs and eligibility requirements, walk through the application process and answer any questions. Uh, we want to thank Commissioner Lockhart for his suggestion that we open this up to the public. Uh, also, uh, we've released the 2017 guidelines and applications for the economic development programs. The program categories remain unchanged from 2016 and include substantial development, signage and facade, and small <coughs> business assistance. Most significant, uh, 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 sorry, I lost my train of thought there. A pre application meeting with a member of the development staff is a program requirement for anyone who wishes to apply. Uh, the City of Sandusky is accepting applications for formula year 2017 Community Development Block Grant. Uh, you heard about that from Ariel, so I will repeat that uh, in this report. Uh, but also, we do want to let the public know that there will be a presentation on the individual proposed neighborhood plans for the Sandusky Neighborhood Initiative on Saturday, February 18th at the Sandusky State Theater. The presentations will run from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Citizens are invited to attend one or all of the neighborhood presentations as all six neighborhood plans will be presented back-to-back -back with a lunch provided to participants from noon to 1 p.m. at the State Theater. Moving on to Sandusky Transit. The launch of all the new routes for public transit is being pushed back from February 6th to March 21st to ensure that staff can dedicate the proper resources to ensure a smooth launch of changes to our service and the spark fare increase of a, from $1 to $1.50 went into effect on February 6, 2017. Uh, also from Public Services, the Lions Park Submerged Pier will have buoys marking the shallow water. Property maintenance will work with the Sandusky Fire Department to place buoys this spring. We'll also begin to take shelter reservations on March 1st. Please call 419-627-5884 for a list of shelters and reserve your day. As always, this is first come, first serve, and the number to reserve shelters is 419-627-5884. Uh, recreation. We're excited to announce tonight that the City of Sandusky plans to enter into a partnership agreement with the Cedar Point Sports Center, uh, particularly the Sports Force Park. Uh, we'd like to ask the Commission for a motion for the approval to transfer funds from the Recreation Department to Sports Force for the Coaster Classic Softball Tournament. Uh, basically, we'll be moving from Dorn Fields to the new Sports Force Park, the Coaster Classic event, Victoria who oversees that event and is here, had already begun to take reservations and teams. Uh, ultimately, we'll be transferring the, the, the management as well as the, the, the accounting for that event to Sports Force uh, as part of a larger agreement for Sports Force to become a sponsor of city uh, recreation programs, which will entail a five-year, uh, $50,000 total commitment to support local recreational programming in the city, as well as uh, an agreement for public access to the sports force fields for a certain amount of dates for years for things such as all-star games or championship games for our local youth sports tournaments. So we just want to say uh, thank you to Will Spence, the general manager of sports force, for working with Corey to put that deal together. And we see it as a great sign of an early partnership where we'll let them focus on baseball, softball, soccer, and lacrosse events geared to tourists so that we can use our resources from that partnership and otherwise to do events that will be more focused on locals or, or for things that aren't able to be done uh, at those fields. So we're excited about that. And again, I'd ask for a motion to approve the transfer of funds that Victoria has so collected. Yeah. So, uh, motion. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Then yeah. a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Chairman, I think this is fabulous. I've, been, I've snuck in out there. Okay, I didn't have a greeting. I didn't have a greeting, or I was on anybody's list. You trespassing? You didn't say that when you well, here. I mean, God, yeah. well, I snuck around out here, and them parks are really, really neat. It reminds me of the Toledo mud hens, almost the little diamonds. They got you know parks for different fences, you know, for distance and that, but. I think that's great. That's that's going to be really neat, and I'm excited for. Oh uh, yes, if they had hot dogs there too. No one was there but myself. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my out. shadow. <laughs> no. I think it's a great. I think it's a great deal. I'm glad you. I'm glad you secured that. So good. So, Chairman, it's cool. Uh, I just want to clarify. Uh, the funds that you're talking about are funds that people, that teams have sent in to pay for this? Deposits. The, yeah. the, they're already deposits. There's, I just want to make sure the record recognize, public recognizes when I talk about city funds. Exactly. Yep, thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Further discussion? 
Mr. Kresser, would you pull the commissioner since we're talking about money here? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That motion is adopted. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to thank Victoria, who worked really hard to help put this deal together. Uh, also, the Shelby Street public boat launch uh, will have a request for proposals issued on February 8th for the operation of the boat ramp facility for the 2017 season, running April 1st through October 31st. We had a vacancy at the morning side of the there. Our proposals are due by Friday, February 24th at 3 p.m. Also, we're excited to announce that Jason Moreland from the Sandusky Register will begin employment with the City of Sandusky Recreation Department as a recreation program supervisor starting February 21st. Uh, Jason's been an active member of our rec board and, and has a lot of expertise in recreation and events. We look forward to him partnering with Victoria to take things to another level for recreation. And that concludes my uh, very long remarks this evening. Thank you, Mr. Wilkes. Commissioner's <coughs> questions or comments for the manager? Mr. Chairman. Also in Lions Park, and I met with uh, Mr. Wink last week, not only are we doing the uh, buoys out there, but we're going to be getting the racks along the shoreline, correct? And then we're also looking into putting maybe some trees or, or the erosion problem, I guess. So I want to give kudos to Mr. Link uh, for following through and all that because that's a, been a big uh, thing on Facebook and throughout the city when I get out. Uh, what, what's going to happen with the uh, shoreline out there at Lions Park? So we're in the process of looking at how we can fix that and make this a great park. It's Jim Park from ONDR was the, our contact, correct? So we just didn't pull this out of a hat. This is all legit. We're going to have the boys out there. And probably when we do the, what, the next week or so, we're going to be putting the new equipment in at Lions Park. And then we'll be on the beach when, <coughs> as soon as possible, we get the rest of the sidewalks and the streets out. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Poole. Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, Mr. Waddington, you, you, you spoke pretty quickly. ODNR is telling us where to put these boys. Is that, that what the That's who our contact is? person was. The ODNR is not buoys. necessarily telling us where to put the buoys. The right. ODNR we contacted about the erosion. <coughs> right. The, like that. the buoys were marking, there's a old pier right. that goes out, and they're marking it as shallow, rocky water for right. people who are using the water recreationally. Okay, and the only reason I ask is generally when you start talking about water, I'm always wondering who's got the authority to do what. So and is this something that we can go do and nobody, there's no question? It's not yes. the Coast Guard or somebody, some other federal authority that has a as say in as, this? As long as we are not, through you, Commission President, Commissioner Poole, as long as we are not marking it as a no-wake zone or anything like that, as long as it's a shallow water marking, then we're okay. okay. Mr. Chairman, I have one cool. other question dealing with uh, community development. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm simply not in favor of increasing the uh, assistance to facades from 60% to 75%. Uh, it's just for a couple reasons. One, functionally, if, if there's going to be a 15% increase every year, then there's no reason for people to invest in their, in improving this year because it'll go up. The concept of starting at 60 uh, it seems to me the incentive would be that it would be 55 and then 50 to encourage people to get on board, adding to it, first of all, and, and additionally, I think 75% is just entirely too much. No longer economic development, it is simply, you call us up and we'll fix up your house or property or whatever it is. And just, I, don't, I don't see any re great return on investment from that. Randomly, as people apply across the town in little different places, that we just pay to improve their property, especially at 75%. If you didn't get enough at 60%, uh, additionally, let me add to this. Those people who stepped up and took a risk and invested in their properties with us the first year, it is probably a slap in the face to, for those who waited and didn't take the risk to get 75% next year. I think it's just a backwards way to look at dealing with the businesses here, in addition, I think 75% is more than we should use, it should be. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady. Mr. Wilson, I wonder if you could uh, confirm for me the start time for that transient rental meeting. I, I've been using 
I noticed you use six thirty in your in your briefing, but our your our reporter says six o'clock. Six thirty. Six thirty. It is six thirty. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Additional questions or comments for the manager? I have no comments, but since no one has a comment at all, then I will simply make a motion that we'll either get a second or not that we remain the uh, facade signage uh, assistance remain at sixty percent. Second. Been a motion and second. Discussion. Mr. Whoopser or Mr. Lasco, who could share with us the rationale behind that? Since we're getting into this level of detail, I don't. I'm not. I'm not you know, just either right person, Mr. Lasco. I don't. Yeah, know. yeah. I can certainly start <laughs> if uh, uh, City Manager Whoopser wants to step in. That's that's certainly fine. Um, you know, we created these programs back in 2016, both from the housing development standpoint and both from an economic development standpoint, with a commitment to reevaluate based on usage and investment whether those levels need to be raised or lowered. So, for example, using the housing programs as a parallel, we know that the down payment assistance program and the exterior repair program were heavily, heavily utilized. So, what we did in making a small amendment is we reduced the amount folks could get from a matching grant and the percentage folks can receive from a down payment assistance grant. Um, what we realized from our economic development programs is we know that we need to make a larger investment up front for those folks that are taking risks. I agree that you know we're increasing it from 75 to 60 percent from last year, but I think those folks that also receive 60 percent assistance are very, very grateful for the assistance they received from the city and still had to take a chance on the city, whether it's at 40 percent or 25 percent. So I think we know until we hit that critical mass that we need to continue to look at ways to change our program and divvy up and increase or decrease the levels of investment we're making based on usage. And if we're overtaxed one year or overexpended one year based on the large investments downtown, we can look at scaling that back or lowering the cap that can go into projects. But I think we put a lot of thought into what we need to do to stimulate investment and stimulate activity. And with specific concern for the facade and signage program based on usage, what we have heard from folks is there's still some economic challenges that warrant the city stepping up the level of investment that we make into those properties. And the only thing that I would add to uh, through Commission President to Director Lasco's was there were a few very large scale properties that were prioritized for the, the very challenging facades they have. And as we've gone down the road to look at just how extensive the costs would be to uh, repair some of the exteriors of those properties, it is going to be an extremely incredible burden but the, the blight of those properties is a challenge that all of us face uh, in certain corridors of the city or downtown. And so we knew that for certain catalytic projects that a higher level may be the ins appropriate incentive that can get folks to act who otherwise may not have the resources to act. And we've heard from a few commissioners that some of the other larger extensive projects we did last year weren't as comprehensive enough uh, and uh, that they would have liked to see a little more attention to historic detail. And we know that the reason that, that windows potentially weren't done in a historic way we'd like to see them uh, is because of very real cost limitations. And so the 75% is to really get at some of those recommendations that were made by a few specific commissioners. Uh, and this is a way to help us get there within the means of, uh, within the, means of the program and, the, and of our partners. Additional questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lloyd. I think it's a fantastic opportunity that we can increase this with... Um, we had nothing before, and then we keep if we can keep improving for those that can't afford to improve their facades. Now we're just helping them even more. So I'd like to support our community and our property owners to help them maintain their buildings. So if we can give them a little bit more to continue this, then I'm all for it. So I won't support the motion. No questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lockhart. Question. Now, uh, Director Lasko, you said that you shifted some of the money from the from the individual homeowners to the facades of some of the major. Or no, it, it, can you explain that again to me? Where the money? Went? Yeah, I, I was merely to, through the commission president to Commissioner Lockhart. I was merely using our housing programs as sort of a parallel um, comparison to shifting resources and level of investment based on need and based on demand. So I use the housing program as an example where our down payment assistance program and our exterior repair repro programs were heavily, heavily used to the point where we thought it made sense to actually scale back the level of investment and we would still have a significant demand. So you scaled back the level of investment in what areas? 
down payment assistance and exterior repair. But I'm, we, we didn't exterior. move money from we right. didn't move money from housing to ED. Down payment assistance and exterior repair of residential structures. And you've shifted the money to, or you are you increasing no, 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 the no, amount no. of sixty or seventy percent in where? So just to clarify, our housing programs are three hundred thousand dollars a year. Those funds never move into the economic development program funds. I'm merely talking about the levels of investment we make within sub programs, whether it be housing or ED. Another good example is our substantial redevelopment program from a housing development standpoint provided a $3,500 grant for folks investing $50,000 and a $5,000 grant for folks investing $100,000. And what we heard extensively from folks is that is not a significant subsidy to allow them or to warrant them making a larger investment into their property. So well, for a housing standpoint, that was actually one where we lowered the threshold of investment into a property from fifty thousand to twenty thousand to receive a thirty-five hundred dollar grant, and hundred thousand to fifty thousand, based on feedback we received from folks saying the level of investment or subsidy coming from the city is not substantial enough for me to raise the level of investment I'm making into my property. And I will say, obviously, increasing it from sixty to seventy-five percent is a change, but I don't believe this is precedent setting in any way. We're only two years into the program, uh, and we'll always make efforts to amend those programs based on demand on an annual basis and based on usage. So I certainly don't view this as a precedent setting where next year we're going to necessarily increase it to 80 or 85 or 90 percent in a specific program. Um, again, just the warning that we're only two years into this program. And, and through the commission, <coughs> commission, just a reminder, the, the residential programs that Matt mentioned are funded through issue eight, which is the, the income tax dollars that were set aside for blight elimination per that. The economic development programs are exclusively funded from the admissions tax, which was something that Cedar Point had asked us to uh, to, to look at uh, to diversify the tax base when we did that agreement. So those are all admissions tax dollars. They're not general fund, you know, income tax dollars, uh, which I think is an important distinction. And again, we're made we're done so at the request of, of, of our partners and that that vote or effort. Additional questions or comments, Mr. Chairman. Cool. One question: You talk you. Uh, what you did with the housing program follows <coughs> makes makes good sense. That was very good. You talked about this program as this move. Uh, you said talked about critical mass is going to determine when you critical. You spoke of critical mass as the determining point that you figure out where this percentage hits the right number is what I is what I took from that. What's what will that be? What what have you said is the, the what's the, ma the the metric that identifies when we hit that critical mass? Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that if we have, for example, we set aside fifty or hundred thousand dollars a year annually for facade and signage, and not only do we expend those funds entirely in a calendar year, but then we also have a wait list of folks that are looking for those dollars. I think that tells us that we can probably scale back the level of investment we're making into those properties. So instead of doing only five properties and, have, and having to wait list another five properties, we could possibly lower the threshold and get 10 properties done on an annual basis. But what we know is from the first year, we did not expend the entire funds in that particular program. Um, so we thought it made sense to take a shot at and looking at investing higher levels into those projects so folks can overcome the barriers that come with things such as historic renovation, et cetera. So, I can't put a number on it other than to say if we fully commit our funds in a calendar year and still have folks knocking down our door for those resources, we probably have the ability to scale back that level of investment that we're considering making into those properties. Okay. The, that's an interesting concept, which I, I, I'm kind of getting to where you're going to. I just want to point out to you that that logic feeds into exactly what I said. When their money in the bank is earning, when their money that they be investing in their place that they have in the bank is earning one or two percent. If you don't hit your 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 threshold, your critical mass this year, following what you're doing now means you'll have to go from seventy five higher. And so and I just, just recognize it may not turn out the way you wish, because anybody that's got real money and is being prudent recognizes that your thought process for how you run the program is that if I don't get enough people borrowing from using it, I'll raise the incentive. So that's their incentive to not participate. And, and, and I was just saying. And maybe 75% of work, I'm listening to you, and it's like, okay, just rec recognize that that is what we're doing. And close enough. 
and I would just say, in, make this pass. I would just say in closing, with only two years as a track record, I, I, again, I don't think we're precedent setting. And if, and if we, we find out this year's we're still lacking in folks' utilization of the program, there may not be a facade and signage program. We may choose to invest those funds in things like substantial redevelopment. So. I wouldn't necessarily say that we would consider increasing the level of investment on a program that's being underutilized. We may do away with that subprogram entirely. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Um, just to clarify, um, the way this states, it says maximum of 75%. So if you get a lot of applications, you don't have to offer 75%. You could still offer 60%. Yeah, every, every application would still get, uh, through the Commission President to Commissioner Lloyd, every application would still be vetted through the Economic Development Review Committee, mm -hmm. in which they would take a long look at the program and make recommendations, again, up to 75%, but certainly it could be. Mm -hmm. Some of these restorations are very expensive, so I think it is nice to have that option to give 75%, um, and maybe if there are many applications, we can look to give a little bit less and help more. But it's nice to give you the option to vet those out. Additional questions or comments? Uh, just one comment. At, at the end of the day, um, I'm, we need to say at some point how you're going to measure that this investment being made by the citizens and people's personal property, what we've actually got to show for it, mm -hmm. besides their property values gain of the individual private person. And I think that uh, the Finance Committee has seen, and I think it's distributed to the entire Commission from time to time, the additional private dollars that have been leveraged as a result of uh, these various programs. So I, I, see, I think that's certainly one metric uh, that we can use to follow that. And I want to uh, support staff for being uh, innovative and flexible. I don't think we should adopt a program and say it's going to be that way for uh, forever. Um, I think if supply and demand indicates we should make an adjustment, then I want to support that kind of flexibility. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brady. Um, once again, I'll refrain, I've refrained from the discussion on this issue because I sell signs for a living. <laughs> Further questions or comments? <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waddington. The motion was to cap it at 60, correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Cresser, would you pull the commissioners on the motion, please? Mr. Waddington? No. Ms. Lloyd? No. Mr. Lockhart? Can I think about it? Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'd say yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. <coughs> Mr. Murray? No. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? No. Mr. Brady? Abstain. That motion is adopted. Other questions for the city manager? Uh, Mr. Chairman. I mean, the motion fails. The motion fails. fails. Yeah. Said the wrong way. Thank you. Uh, just a couple things. Ms. Soloway, uh, thank you for saying yes when Mylan called. Um, I think that's outstanding. We should help our neighbors when they need that kind of help. I, I know the police department and the fire department do that on a very regular basis. And Ms. Klein, I know you help other uh, jurisdictions with expertise, as I'm sure everyone on staff does. But I was glad to see that. So thank you for that, uh, that kind of leadership. And uh, the, uh, with respect to the governor coming to the city of Sandusky, I just think that it's so exciting. And it's just a great opportunity. And I guess that I sued him. Um, but uh, that was a while back. He might have forgotten at this point in time. But I mean, the governor, uh, whatever you think of his policies in a lot of different areas, he's been um, a leading uh, advocate for some of our environmental resources. Um, he stepped up when we needed him to step up and vetoed a terrible piece of legislation that the legislature adopted in connection with the Great Lakes Compact that would have allowed too much water to be withdrawn, and uh, that was reckless. And he's been uh, he's been there um, on when when we need him uh, for both the protection of the environment and for protection of business uh, when it comes to some of the environmental legislation um, and the renewable energy. Uh, so I I appreciate his stewardship in that regard. I'm glad he's uh, chosen the city of Sandusky and the Senator um, Gardner and Representative Ard. Um, it's really great they're going to bring the General Assembly here as well as the governor. So I'm looking forward to all that for the public. I don't know if the date was mentioned. It's April 4th. They're going to be here. Unless there are further questions or comments for the city manager, we will turn to old business. Anyone having any items of old business? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waddington. I'd like to make a motion to extend the boards and commissions another 30 days. 
Uh, we have a finance meeting next week. I'm con we have three uh, members from the finance committee, and tomorrow would end the 30-day deadline that we uh, voted on prior. Uh, this gives the law department, uh, Mr. Harris and Mrs. Twine and yourself, uh, plenty of time that we can get this resolved. And hopefully we were going to have information. I believe Friday we didn't attain anything that I that I saw. So I would like to extend it 30 days so that these board members, so we can have meetings and so they have enough folks there for a quorum. Second. second. There's a motion and second discussion. Mr. Mr. Harris, I know you're close and you had indicated to me that the complication was that we are touching so many different pieces of, the, of our ordinances that we actually have several pieces of legislation that right. have to be adopted. I mean, we, uh, I mean, it's 99.9% it's .9 done. We had 20, 27 items on today's agenda. We probably had 44, I think, if we <laughs> pushed it through <clears throat> this meeting. So we will um, circulate a memo. Um, Commissioner Twine and I um, touch base on some of the other boards and questions that I'll circle up and uh, legislation to you tomorrow. But, uh, it'll be a member with my recommendations on the other fourth commission and we'll a couple weeks to uh, digest and dissect. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Harris. Further Mr. questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, my concern was uh, with finance committee uh, next month, the budget's due, so we got to have them folks on here. I don't want to have them call on or question commissioners in my on off, and I just thought, let's be straight up and get this done. Good. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Further questions or discussion? Mr. Chairman, just cool. a thought about these commissions, and since we have not seen what, what is being proposed yet, may I suggest that we do these in little pieces? All these don't have to be done all at once. It's 27 at a time. You pick the ones that are really important or that are to start with that we act that, you know, state or the state mandated ones, for example, so we have some time to discuss each one, if there is any discussion. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll give you all the information and then the commission can see uh, fit whether they want to handle them all at once or, or, or piecemeal. And I think the way it's rolled out now, that it'll be easier than, a, than I anticipated in terms okay. of addressing all of them. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Just thought we'd do it a different way, Mr. Kressler. You're looking at me like I did something funny there. Uh, <laughs> other items of old business. Are there any items of new business? Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, Is that me? Mr. Uh, Mr. Lockhart, I think you were first. Yeah, I just wanted to touch base on the housing program once again. I had asked that uh, Mr. Lasko and his department come together and put together a forum for uh, residential uh, citizens in the city so that we can all get together with contractors because I saw that there's a problem with some of the residents finding contractors to get these estimates in for their application, which is part of the process, or is required for the application process. And so I hope that everyone that uh, needs this will come out this Wednesday at 5 p.m. and join us uh, at the main fire station. I think Matt's going to be bringing some food, pizza, I don't know, something. I hope. <laughs> something. <laughs> Good home cooking. Uh, but 5 p.m. at the main fire station. <laughs> 5 p.m. at the main fire station, and so we'll have contractors and, and residents together to explain throughout the uh, application process for the grants. Mr. Waddington. Uh, Saturday, the coffee commission, Mr. Brady and I are going to be here. We're going to buy the coffee from Mr. Smith, so it's a lot quieter. It's just got too noisy down there with coffee grinders and uh, people talk. So we're going to meet here, and the time is going to be 8.30 to 9.30, so we can get to the State Theater at 10 o'clock. So we got to note that time change, and we'll have coffee here, correct? Correct. Okay. Other items of new business? Mr. Chair. I, I uh, would like to make a motion for an executive session. <laughs> I, I was thinking of abstaining, but but uh, I'm going to make a motion for <laughs> going to make a motion for an executive session uh, to deal with the potential uh, potential purchase of real real estate. Second. Been a motion and second. Discussion? Mrs. Cresser, would you pull the commissioners on the motion? Mr. Waddington? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Lockhart? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Mr. Poole? Yes. Ms. Twine? Yes. Mr. Brady? Yes. That executive session is set. Other items of new business? Mr. Chairman, Mr. To regard to meetings, the uh, meeting that uh, Mr. Lockhart just spoke of, it, we have back-to-back -back meetings on the same night, and just as you go forward, it's tough to make both. So the, the public participants, for the public to go to this, they'd have to 
be on Star Trek and get beamed from one to the other. So please consider that in the future when we're making these meetings. Other items of new business. With the Chief's announcement of his retirement, uh, we um, have to turn to the Charter for kind of a funny little procedure that we have uh, set there. But the Charter is very specific about how it is we go about uh, selecting the replacement for both the Police Chief and Fire Chief. Um, and uh, the Charter provides, and I'm paraphrasing, but Mrs. Presser and I have reviewed it recently, and Mr. Harris, to make sure we have, we have it right. The Charter provides that uh, the Commission President is to chair the Selection and Review Board, Selection Board, excuse me, uh, and that that is also um, uh, supposed to be populated by the Chairman of the Civil Service Commission, um, which in this case is Vince Rhodes, and I've talked with him, and he is willing to serve. And then I am to make uh, three other appointments to the selection board and with the commission's consent. And so I'm appointing uh, Bob Varner and Mike Meinzer, both uh, former fire chiefs, along with Abby Bemis, uh, and would uh, ask for um, the commission's approval of those appointments. So moved. Second. second. Then a motion and second. Discussion. I know it's happening a little fast, but we want to get in the process of getting a new chief selected, and otherwise we'd have to wait uh, two weeks before we could get uh, that put together. And I would hope that we would proceed as we have in the past, which is just using our own staff. Um, that's going to be up to the selection board to decide, but uh, just using our own staff uh, to make the advertisements and uh, using the committee to, or the, the board to review um, the, 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 the uh, various applicants. And then, as some of you will recall, the way that works is that the uh, selection board uh, doesn't really do the selecting. It's a little bit of a misnomer. The selection board gives one, two, or three recommendations to the city manager, but then makes the determination as to who would be hired. And uh, Traditionally, it's always been two or three names that have been put forward. I, I kind of question one part because it wouldn't seem like it's consistent with the process. So um, there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and those folks are appointed. Thank you. Any other items of new business? When we return to audience participation, anyone wishing to address the commission on any items of city business, please step to the microphone, give us your name and address, and share with us your thoughts. Mr. Chairman, um, I wasn't, I, I Mr. didn't. Mr. Zuloff, uh, introduce yourself, please. Mike Zuloff. Uh, I guess I'll introduce myself by saying I uh, volunteer as a member of the Design Review Committee. Uh, and the reason I'd, I'd like to uh, address you is because I, I listen with great interest on the matter of the exterior renovations and, and the percent uh, of, of subsidy in, in that program. And uh, with full appreciation for the, the pros and cons either way, um, a number of, uh, of course, as you as you know, this this uh, board or this uh, committee uh, serves at the pleasure of the um, city commission, I think, but is advisory to the planning commission, which uh, rules on the matter of of, uh, of whether uh, exterior renovations, exterior changes to those businesses in the historic district uh, conform to the. Uh, to the law that we have, uh, to whether it conforms to the design review guidelines. So um, what happens is that people who, who have properties in this historic district, right, have an additional burden of, uh, of conforming to those guidelines uh, for the greater good, because it's good for economic development to protect our heritage and to make the uh, the downtown an interesting place to visit, and it's an important thing to do. But but there there are, it results in extra costs. So there's there's an, a rationale for providing a subsidy for those exterior renovations, uh, in addition to the economic benefit, but a, a justice in in that there are uh, those additional uh, uh, costs and burdens. So. Um, but there's some flexibility in that process. So sometimes these renovations that are proposed are highly compliant with the design review guidelines. And sometimes out of necessity and pragmatism, we're forced to uh, be more flexible 
uh, in, in, in the approval. So it, it seems that we're, we can find ourselves highly subsidizing something that doesn't really conform completely to the historic guidelines. So it may be a, a good solution would be to use the flexibility in the percent uh, to, to make sure that those, that highest percentage is reserved only for those projects that are uh, highly compliant and, 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 and uh, do the best job of honoring and protecting the, the historic uh, aspects of, of those properties. Would, would that, uh, and, and uh, so that's a thought that I don't, I don't think would be readily apparent uh, and, and only, be, only became apparent to me after years of being involved in this. So I think maybe that I would encourage the, uh, 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 you don't have to comment on it, but I'd encourage the uh, administration uh, as, as they work so diligently on, this, on these matters to, to consider that dimension of, of the, uh, uh, of the design review guidelines and of this, <coughs> this worthy uh, um, uh, uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sula. Mr. Mayor, Tim Schwanger, 362 Sheffield Way. Just for clarification on item number one, which was the uh, Shoreline Drive project, I believe, with Osborne Engineering, mm -hmm. there was two abstaining one voting no, so it did not pass under section 14 of the charter, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, thank you. The um, Lions Park discussion this evening uh, regarding the buoys and uh, some kind of riprap probably down at the east end, is that considered a temporary fix, a permanent fix? Anybody care to? We're going to put in some natural grasses to try to keep the erosion control to the minimum. So that so there's no discussion then in the future of rebuilding the break wall, simply marking it from here on out. Okay. Okay. You get you know, and Mr. Murray, he lives on you live on Causeway on the Cedar Point Road there, uh, you know you can only slow down Mother Nature, you can't stop it. So this might be a good fix, you know, for a couple, two, three years, but you're, it's not going to stop the erosion problem. But that, that's okay. At least it's something. At least we're doing something. The uh, other question, another question is, we're le losing one police officer through retirement moving on are we is there plans to replace that officer with a new with another one or just going with what we have on hand chief i assume you're going to be hiring them that's you mr president we're uh finalizing the uh, advertisement to uh the public for the new testing process and once that's uh public um there'll be a testing process the national testing network was what we used last time we were very happy with that so um, we're looking at March, April-ish to uh, form a list. Once we get the list, we'll start doing backgrounds, interviews, and all of those things. So we uh, are aggressively trying to get that position replaced uh, by summer. Thanks, Chief. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. The, other, the last question has to do with the Economic Development Fund, which comes from Cedar Point. I don't, and I don't know if Cedar Point uses prevailing wage in all the projects they do. But it, it appears to me, based on the city manager's report from tonight, which he did, really didn't discuss a whole lot about the image baking project, but it looks like they're not going to use CDBG money, which is a state federal funding mechanism, because they don't want to pay the prevailing wage. And I guess I'm here to ask the commission in the future, maybe not this year, maybe next year, that if the federal government and the state government uh, requires that prevailing wage be paid, that our economic development fund also require prevailing wage, and I know it's you know a little bit more, it's somewhat cost more costly, but it prevents a, a business from hiring, you know, Acme Paint from down the street to pay ten dollars an hour. Um, one of the things we saw way back in 2004 with a major development along the waterfront is that we have indications that that developer was paying people in brown paper bags to do that project. So there needs to be additional you know, requirements that, again, pay, prevailing wage 
uh, you know, a good wage be paid for any of these uh, economic development uh, programs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schroeder. Anyone else wishing to address the commission? And we will take a short recess. And, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't see you getting up. Hi, Vicki Bird, 2114 Wilbert Street. It's been a little while since I've been here. Um, I just wanted to comment. I, I did watch, I did get to catch the meeting from the 23rd, uh, January 23rd. And um, I wanted to say thank you that the Erie County, uh, Mr. Shade and the Erie County Health Department was here um, giving the presentation that they did, especially in regards to the HUD and LUD grant and the prevention of that in our homes throughout the city, which my understanding is uh, probably pretty much the majority of, I should say, what, 50% rental? Not quite 70, but 50. Um, I am living in a home that I rent. Who do I call? Ghostbusters. Find out about lead, because I know our porch was redone because of lead. <coughs> so um, I'm interested in finding out if it's throughout the rest of the house, because I do have very young grandchildren that come into the home. Um, I'm appreciative of the whole presentation in regards to the algae bloom talking about upgrading Jackson Street Pier. I don't go down there or Lions Park or Shoreline Park to look at green water. Um, our water department, our disaster preparedness, which you know, read the newspaper when I see that there's people in military uniform <coughs> at our water treatment plant, it kind of makes you go, <gasps> that's kind of crazy. That's a little on the scary side. And I think there's enough fear um, mongering out there going on right now. And I'm just appreciative that our police department, our fire department, those are the people that are going to be calling and responding and handling that. Um, and present at the detox center as well. Uh, another place that's going on in the West End. Uh, kind of, still. I know it's getting worked on. I appreciate it. Sunoco, Hoppers, GNC Foundry. Looks good, looks great. I understand there may be some housing going in there on uh, Venice and Tiffin. I think that's a good thing. It would be great if it could be single, you know, buy a home. Uh, we are getting older. We're not getting any younger. Uh, five and a half months, I'll be a senior citizen. So <laughs> I know I need to be able to have affordable housing, whether it's owning a home or renting a home. Um, I'm also looking possibly forward to that because maybe that means sidewalks will get in faster there. Safe crossing there at Route 6, Venice. Tiffin and Sanford, because it's still difficult to walk that. Um, and the West End, they are asking for, although I realize now I live on the south side, or not south side, but south end. It's um, considered the south end of town. We live in what I call the Bermuda Triangle. It's kind of forgotten about, although our park's getting repaired. And I hope to see that soon, come this spring. Um, Wilbur Street Park. I didn't even know it had a name. I had to ask. Um, I'm curious as to know if there's any thought process out there in regards to Tiffin Ave overpass, the railroad overpass, if that's in the works down the road a piece. Because when it rains, it pours, it floods. It is crumbling. Uh, please, take a drive under it. Get out and walk it and look around. Please. Um, I do want to say thank you for GNC Foundry. It's pretty excited about that. There are people that have moved into the condos right on the water there from other towns, surrounding areas, Sandusky County, that are very appreciative. Um, you may know who that is. I won't give his name, though. Uh, Chesapeake Lofts and the revitalization of the Jackson Street Pier. Um, this room should be packed like it was last time. And there were quite a few people here. Um, Parking, I, I didn't assume when I saw the picture in the newspaper that it was going to look exactly like that. That is one of the first things I did notice, though. I was like, oh, buddy, where are people going to park? And the fence on the edge is going to fly because people want access to the water. They need to be able to fish off that pier. We need to keep some parking. Um, I will say this. I know that when I drive down there in the summertime, at least half of that parking lot is empty cars sitting for people coming into town, getting on two boats, three boats, and leaving the city. When they leave the city, they leave their cars. They're not leaving their money necessarily. 
uh, although they will pay an admissions tax. Am I not mistaken? Do you pay an admissions tax? Can anybody tell me, Mr. Not, Mayor? Not for the ferries. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Not for the ferries, no. Not for the ferries? Oh, so then they're not. They pay for and that admissions tax is 50% of it is what is we're using for economic development, correct? Well, that's a good thing. And people only pay it, I don't think they realize, they think they think they're just paying it. You're not going to pay it unless you're going to Cedar Point or you're going to a venue that charges an admissions tax. If you're not doing that, if you're not being a tourist in your own town, you don't pay the admissions tax. The tourists pay it. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people that come into the city every summer, every spring, summer, and fall. Um, I'm looking forward to a Jackson Street Pier that I can go down and do something more than just sit in my car and eat lunch. I can get out, take, even take the kids to the splash pad. If there's a fence, make sure it's around that. Just a suggestion. Not around the end. Make sure people still have access that they can fish. But I would like to see it eco-friendly, and that's the purpose of the trees. I know I don't go down there to look at trees, but we need trees, we need flower beds for stormwater runoff into our waters. Um, I'd like to see it more family-oriented, accessible, connected, a destination where people can come to and enjoy uh, for the entire city because we're a whole community not just people who live downtown and people who have businesses downtown um, there's a few words I want to put out there uninformed misinformed misunderstood miscommunication and dismissiveness uh, sometimes people can be uninformed sometimes they are misinformed <clears throat> um, sometimes they misunderstand uh, sometimes there can be a little bit of lack of communication or miscommunication, but when you're going to come up against people, somebody else mentioned this, um, please listen. Don't be so dismissive. You're going to have people that, you know, there's the word obstructionist out there. Where they, all, they all stand up. They don't agree with you, whatever the case. When you dismiss that and you tell them they can go someplace else, <clears throat> They remember that. They don't appreciate that. It's disrespectful. Um, and when you choose to run again, those are the things that people are going to remember. And they may choose not to vote for you again if you're just going to be dismissed. Um, again, when issue eight passed, 50%, my understanding, 50% of the money uh, uh, from the admissions tax, which is a uh, you know, I think it's a good thing. I'm glad Cedar Point was willing to give us that 1% because we kind of had to fight for that. 50% uh, is going towards economic development, and that's a good thing. People need to understand that. The other 50% goes into our general fund. Um, that emissions tax is paid by the tourists. I think I said that. Uh, so when we're getting picky um, and worrying about what you're spending and where you're spending and um, it's my understanding that you have already won an award for being as transparent as you can with our finances and I hope that you will continue to do that. Um, I see that coming. Um, I mean the city's moving forward it's across it's at a crossroads that's the way I see it and um, it's a burden upon you people up here to see that it's done and that it's done right and that it accommodates and it's, and it's community oriented, that it's gonna be someplace that when our governor does come here, if he ever comes again, and that's a great thing, um, he's gonna to wanna to come here instead of Vermillion, where he spent most of his time growing up as a child. Um, I wanna see Sandusky as a destination place, not just Cedar Point. City of Sandusky. I wanna see our waterfront accessible uh, open, uh, something you can walk. Uh, not particularly worried about parking my car on a pier because when you go any place else on vacation, on any waterfront, you're not normally parking on a pier. You're walking out on that pier, you're shopping, you're buying food, you're sitting, you're watching people concrete walk, surf in the water, uh, have good times. Um, there's just one thing I want to leave you. I'll give this to you, Mr. Murray. Cut it out of the newspaper. I know I can think how a lot of people feel. And it's hopefully that's what they are doing in Cleveland. We're not Cleveland, but we are on the waterfront or on the north coast. Thank you, Mr. And I think we should use it. 
And I just want to thank you all for what you do. Actually, you've all been working hard, and I'm not here complaining, really. <laughs> this, is, this isn't complaints. These are thank yous on that West End. And one other thing, Mr. Schwanger was right when he mentioned last week, people living on the West End live in a food desert. It's 2.7 miles from the intersection of your road and Barrett Road to the nearest store, which not is a full-service grocery store. It is four miles to save a lot. It's five miles to Kroger's. It's also five miles to Crimus's downtown. That's a little <laughs> far for anybody without transportation and children in tow to have to walk to buy some groceries. Convenience stores are not groceries. So I know there's limited space out there. I've always said this is a landlocked town. I see some buildings out there, particularly the intersection of Edgewater and Venice. I don't know who owns that property, but you know what? I just soon come in and tear it down, put up a grocery store, because the way it's looking right now, we, we want to be, we have a corridor coming into, the corridor of Sandusky to me is a West End coming off of Route 6. I mean, that's a corridor as well. So I don't know what kind of brains can get put together and thinking and picking and maybe doing something, but maybe somewhere down the road a piece we can get some a real full service grocery store out on the west end of Sandusky somewhere. Thank you. Great. We will take a three minute recess.